Oh, hey. What are you doing with that microphone? Disclaimer, what? What? Oh. Oh. Hi. Didn't see you there. I'm Jackson, an editor here at DubDoc. Today we're celebrating 5,000 subscribers with a special Q&A episode where we took your questions, including me. We've never formally been introduced, so Steph thought it a good idea to send me out here and tell you a little bit about myself. But first, a disclaimer. The Dub Talk podcast contains a language and content that may not be suitable for younger audiences. Listener discretion is advised. Please be aware that there may be spoilers for various anime throughout the episode. Make sure to use caution in case there is a series you haven't finished yet. Finally, the opinions expressed in today's special episode are those of the individual participants and may not reflect the Dub Talk podcast as a whole. With that out of the way, hi. I used to be a lurker on the old D2 Brigade forums, where I got to know both Hardy and Noah, and I still have the t-shirt to prove it. Fast forward a few years to when Funny was doing Double Talk on Twitch, I hung out in chat and made friends with both Andrew and Megan. In my own time, I was using my editing prowess exclusively for evil and creating cursed objects. Two years ago, almost to the day in fact, Andrew approached me saying he'd like to enlist those powers for Dub Talk. That brings us to today. Thank you so much for helping us hit 5,000 subscribers. I hope you enjoy the show. Now, could you see about maybe getting me out of here? Wait, please, they're only paying me in gotchables. Help! No! Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, and all ages, and all fans of anime, welcome to Dub Talk's 5K Q and A. Um, it, it, again, if you've recently been with us, um, you know that we just reached 5,000 subscribers on YouTube, uh, and to celebrate, we decided to reintroduce ourselves uh, for the people in the back or for the new folks who are joining us and may not know a damn thing about us so we asked for your questions and we're here to deliver your answers um again we may we got we did get quite a few questions and thank you so so much for that um it's very much appreciated and especially in the short amount of time we were actually we were, we were um taking questions uh, please note all questions we're going to try and get to as many questions as humanly possible uh, but we may not get to all of your questions that you've asked us and some hosts may not have answers to all of your questions either um, we're going to see how everything goes uh, with this so I hope you're excited and ready to learn a little bit about a little bit more about all 13 of us here at Dub Talk currently. 838 asks, has there ever been a time when a dub has strongly changed your opinion on a show, either for better or for worse? Yes. Um, Haikyuu, actually. Um, I-, I should love Haikyuu. This should be my jam. And I should have watched it right away. But watching it subtitled, I just couldn't get through it. Like, I just kind of, it kind of slogged for me. And I was like, there has to be a better way for me to watch Haikyuu and really enjoy it as much as everyone else does. And it was the dub. So, um, it's a lot easier. To- it's also a lot easier to watch sports anime when it's dubbed. And Haikyuu was the one that really, like, got it locked in there for me. I do remember dropping Pandy and Stocking about four episodes in, uh, and then much later going back to it when the uh, dub came out. I think just the weirdness and the American influence, like Adult Swim humor, worked much better when translated into English, and cranking up the vulgarity helped sell the tone of the show much better. Just recently... Uh, we watched Island of Giant Insects, and that dub was just so enjoyable. It completely saved that absolute clusterfuck of a sh- of a movie. That movie was just absolutely awful, but the dub elevated it from a uh, abs- from a complete turd to a cult classic. You know, there are probably a few shows that I probably would not have taken the time to watch if they, you know, if they hadn't been dubbed, I probably wouldn't have actually given them time just because, you know, nature of the show and and all that. Tsuki Gaki Ray comes to mind and Suri Dure Children. Probably in my case, some ecchi shows. I don't really particularly like ecchi. I will say I think the dub of Gleepnir made me like the show a lot more than I I thought I would, but Gleepnir ended up being a show that I ended up 
liking a lot more than I expected. Uh, not specifically. Uh, although I do kind of suspect part of the reason I've never gotten that much into the parts of Utena I've seen is in part because I did watch those dubbed, and that's not a very well put together dub, even by the standards of kind of like, like there's good there's good talent in that dub, but it's not no one's particularly well directed. It's very clunky, and it's, it, it doesn't do that show a a service. Um, so maybe that, but I, that's 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 something I can change easily because I haven't had a chance to get around to watching Utena and sub yet. So I'm I'm sure that could change. Uh, probably Booger Stray Dogs. I thought the show was okay when I watched it in Japanese, and I tried to keep up with it, but I didn't really like Ramoro Miyano's Dazai, and I thought he sounded kind of annoying. Uh, KJ Tang's Dazai, on the other hand, really kind of endeared me to him. And the rest of the dub cast was great too, so I had a much easier time watching the show in English, and I ended up really digging it, so definitely Boongo. Boongo Stray Dogs. I... I liked the show in Japanese, but I could not not get into Mamoru Miyano's Dazai performance at all. He just sounded way too obnoxious, too cartoonishly bubbling, and just straight up annoying. And considering how big a character Dazai is in Bungo Stray Dogs, if I don't at least enjoy watching Dazai in the show, it's, it's gonna hurt my overall opinion on the show. But then I watched the dub, and then... KG Tang, his performance as Dazai just made me completely get the character a lot more as a darkly cynical person who puts on this goofy facade to hide, like, his pain and, like, actual character. And suddenly, I got it. Like, KG's just charming talent brought Dazai to life for me and really made me enjoy Bungo a lot more. First time that I ran across an anime dub where the dub actually elevated the material a little bit. Uh, near the end of their foray of existence, ADV Films put out this unknown series called Magicano. Um, it's just like magical comedy series where uh, male protagonist gets hit over the head with hammers a whole lot actually not very deep but if you watch the show in english and i didn't realize this at the time but they make a lot of adaptive changes to the script in uh both the characters saying like there's references to he's gonna have to choke a bitch or there's references to uh willy wonka or disney world or like lots of goofy things thrown in that were definitely not in the original japanese my first girlfriend is a gal when i first watched in the sub it was kind of boring and then the dub came out, and the dub made everything fun. Like, it took the ghost stories approach. It, it made everything as fun as it could be, you know. Ari Ari's my guy asks, uh, Which anime character do you relate to, and what character do you have a personality similar to? It's probably a toss-up between Skullface bookseller Honda-san, because, you know, I am also a put-upon book retailer. Um, Ida from My Hero Academia, because while I'm not as a lead to Ida, I am also a high-strung nerd with bad village who tends to talk with his hands, so I find that very relatable. And the protagonist is Tommy Galaxy, because if you've watched that show and you've spent time with me, or importantly knew me when I was in college, like, you'd make that connection. It's like, yeah, yeah, that guy. Uh, like, we'd be, we'd probably be buds. I would say Arata Kaisaki for me last, because me and him were uh, kind of almost the same person. Except he's doing a lot better than I am like I'm still trying to come up in my career and I'm still trying to get somewhere but but he all but he doesn't hesitate the chance to jump on a new opportunity to help someone you know I'm gonna go with something recent because I made a recent discovery that I am both um Hori and Miyamura and uh Hori Mia <laughs> just like uh if you've seen the show you you know very much details about it. Um, Miyamoto's mental state, I think, is the biggest thing that I can draw comparison to to my own life. Because um, depression sucks. Uh, so I, I, I have little bouts of it myself, and I know how it feels, so I can relate to that. Um, Hori, on the other hand, she's spunky, she's tough. She also is... Um, you know um if you know you know you know where i'm about to go with this it's easy i'm basically if you, if you were to paint me blue and make me furry i'd just basically be a big snorlax i relate to lily from uh zombie land saga 
uh, just being being trans myself. Um, that that whole episode was just wonderful, and you know everyone loves her, and like that's just the big thing for me. It's like I want to be her. Protect protect the Zombie Land Saga girls. We actually uh, we covered this a little bit when we covered the. Uh... The Kyo Annie show, Hyoka. I think I'm really similar to Satoshi Fukabe because he's this uh, very perky, very extroverted, very go getter attitude person, which I definitely relate to. Who uh, you get the sense, and it's kind of revealed throughout the show, that he's kind of contem- he's, um he's compensating for uh, what he feels are his own insecurities by kind of like masking them with that uh, outward persona. And I, I can't deny feeling very similar to that. Like, I try to be happy and fun and life of the party to everyone around me because I'm like, you know, life is rough enough as it is. I, I want other people to feel alleviated. Really, in watching Satoshi in that show, was like, you know, there is a honesty in yourself to, to say to yourself, I really am kind of putting on an act sometimes. It's it's the kind of thing where you don't think about it because it just becomes second nature to be happy and perky all the time. But when you really stop to think about it, you're like, you can afford to be a little downtrodden and honest with yourself about your own insecurity sometimes. My answer to the first one is the main character in Summer Wars, because if you want me to relate to your character, the quickest and easiest way is to have them be born in 1992. Uh, my answer to the second one, I'm thinking the... The best friend character from Nisekoi. I think his name is Shu. The type of guy who could apply himself, could be helpful, but would rather just goof off and be a troll. Um, from Nana, both Nanas, but lately it's been more Hachi Nana than the Rockstar Nana. I'm just going to cop out and say an archetype instead of a particular character. Uh, I have a strong personal attachment to sensitive anime guys who are just huge empathetic characters so like your dekus your alphonse elrics jacuzzi splot armin they also just tend to get shit talked a lot for being useless and being huge big crybabies on the internet by the huge tough guy edgelord so i guess seeing them get to be cool and fight for what's right and be themselves is just really moving to me personally i really relate with it quite a lot for michelle travis is there a show that all of you flat out to reviews for one reason or another? We don't do hentai. That's that's a that's a big one. We just don't do hentai. Personally, I don't want to do Shield Hero. I I don't want to deal with people who who do not want to put up with me saying I do not like the show and here's why. Yeah, I don't think I'm ever gonna touch Shield Hero or I can please don't make me watch I can again, please. Well, first of all, Stephanie has laid it made it perfectly clear we are never going to review any hentai. That's just, mom said no, not going to happen. Um, but while this isn't an issue just yet, as yet, because the show itself has not been dubbed, I think we all have agreed that um, if it does get a dubbed, we are not going to be reviewing Redo of Healer. That's just, we're not going to touch it ever. So please don't ask us. Shield Hero, I Fueta, Sugumomo, even though I want to do that episode. Uh, let's see what else. Oh yeah, if it ever gets a dub, we're not doing we do of here, so don't even ask. I don't know if there's one that we consecutively as an entire group um, would flat out refuse to do that is not hentai. But I think there are a few that individuals might not want to cover. Um, but I can't think of anything in terms of what I wouldn't I would refuse to cover offhand. I'm usually generally pretty open um to sit down and look at some shows i don't think there's one that all of us has uh, i think redo over healer technically comes close but obviously that doesn't have a dub yet knock on wood so maybe that uh as you might guess from the april fool's episode i know a lot of us don't want to review Iken. Uh, i don't agree with that i'm not afraid of Iken. it's 30 minutes and i've seen far stupider things than that generally if it's dubbed and enough people want to do it there's really no limits on that horns off limits though Anime porn is definitely off limits. Gotta keep this, you know, gotta keep it R, not X. I will never ever review Revolutionary Girl Lutena just because it will kill any enjoyment that I have of that show and I refuse to do that to myself. Alice Water Tribe on YouTube asks, will you guys ever talk about your gateway anime? I actually have um, kind of talked about my gateway anime. 
Uh, that being Wolf's Reign. Last year when we were doing our uh, five year celebration, I picked Wolf's Reign because I really wanted to talk about it and it has a special place in my heart because it's kind of how I discovered what anime actually was and not just with kids shows like Pokemon and Yu-Gi-Oh and Digimon, even though those were technically speaking the first ones I had ever watched. Um, but I have talked about my gateway anime, Wolf's Reign, before. I don't have one of those because I didn't watch anime as a younger person. There are shows that I recognize in retrospect were from Japan. Uh, I watched the Grimm's Fairy Tale classic show that aired on Nickelodeon. I know that I caught the uh, Spirited Away broadcast on Cartoon Network back when that was um, really big. But I didn't really have a gateway anime at all. I got I came into actively looking for Japanese animation in college when I was already well versed in a lot of different countries' animated output, but had intentionally been putting off exploring Japanese animation because I'd, I'd always had this this vision that it was more lowbrow than other forms of animation solely because of the shonen shows that were really popular on uh, network television at the time. I had not stayed up late to watch uh, Adult Swim. I, I was not that kind of person growing up. But yeah, so I don't have a gateway anime really. It was uh, really an accumulation of shredding that mentality that all anime was uh, more commercial schlock because obviously it's not there's a lot of variety in there and really you can blame that on the fact that that's just the stuff that got really popular uh, this one's actually pretty simple i watched toonami i really liked dragon ball z a lot see that would be the simple one but if you wanted something a little bit meatier i'd say like when I really dropped off of anime for a few years, Gurren Lagann was the show that got me back into anime altogether. And Clannad was, like, the show that really changed my perspective on anime as a whole. I used to just be, like, a big action shonen guy, and that was, like, the first real, like, emotional, like, romance drama thing that I really watched. And it's very important to me for that reason. I mean, besides Naruto, my gateway anime is Shaman King, so unless Disco Tech or someone else... Decides to pick it up and rescue the four kids, uh, my kind of kid. I'd love to, though. It holds up a lot better than you think it would. Mine was Sailor Moon, or Fushigi Yugi, but probably Sailor Moon. What other what other gateway anime do you need, really? Well, my gateway anime is pretty simple. It's Cowboy Bebop, and I think at this point we're kind of saving that as sort of a Holy Grail episode. So it might we'll probably cover it eventually, but uh, but for now we're just holding on to it. For special for rainy day special occasion uh for me my gateway anime was actually sailor moon but that was before i ever knew sailor moon was an anime and we did uh some of the movies episode on sailor moon r at the same time it kind of flips back and forth between what's the first anime i watched which was also speed racer and believe me if we ever did an episode on speed racer you were here for me first oh, that was a fun childhood uh, we already, I already have an entire episode dedicated to that. Uh, I think it's like the third classics episode on Fruit Basket. And I'll talk about it again when, uh, Fruba final season's done. Because I'm not talking about the new dub until the whole thing's done. I will talk about my gateway anime at some point, but I don't want to talk about it before I'm ready. Because two of my gateway anime are my favorite anime of all time. And it takes a lot for me. Like, I really have to stop and, and think about what I want to talk about with these. Um, plus, one of them has some problematic elements in terms of some of the voice cast. So I, you know, I need to be ready to deal with the pitchforks and torches and the flame wars. Potentially? Uh, like, technically, Pokemon was the first anime I really got into. But the first anime I really knew, like, as an anime, as, like, a cartoon from Japan, was Digimon. And Digimon in English is pretty readily available again. Like, it's streaming on Hulu. Like, um, I think we have vaguely kicked around the idea of covering one of the seasons at some point. So, like, there's, there's a very real chance uh, I would get to do that, at least, which would be fun. I like Digimon. It's a good show. It's fine, because I've been watching anime for about as long as I can remember. Like, I think back to being three years old and watching a cartoon on public television that ended up being an entry in the World Masterpiece Theater series. And just all through childhood being into those monster collectathon series like Yu-Gi-Oh! and Pokemon. But as for a gateway anime, I do have this fun story where uh, Mom had taken us out to a wedding uh, in Sarnia. 
and had sent uh, my brother and me back to the hotel room while she stayed at the reception. Uh, so me and him are just flipping through channels. I'm about uh, 12 years old and we land on uh, Adult Swim actually which is on a cable network that we don't normally get at home uh, and it's playing the Phantom Thief episode of Full Metal Alchemist uh, if you don't recall this is the episode with the beautiful female thief uh, and when uh, Edward Elric falls for the now classic anime pratfall and gets to cup a feel that was enough to send my puberty riddled brain into overdrive and start a lifelong commitment into anime for anyone who has watched love live nijikasaki probably megan or hardy since they know about love live who's your best love live Nijigas- nijikasaki girl now that the anime is finished i actually haven't watched all of that one um i'm kind of waiting on the dub for it because i watched both the uh, first love live and sunshine in dub so kind of following suit here so I don't really have a favorite girl, but just on appearances alone, uh, definitely Tablet Chan. She's uh, the one that stands out the most. <laughs> uh, Rena looks very cute. I've only watched one episode, but that emoji face girl is a total cutie pie. Granted, my opinion is probably going to change a lot once I actually watch the show. Kind of like with Sunshine. I went in thinking I was going to be a Yohane guy. I came out Team Daya. Or Dia. I don't remember. Either way, she hot. Kanata or Rena depends on the day. More mostly Kanata because I I also empathize with being a big sleepy bitch. I got the big sleepy energy, and and Kanata also works really hard for her sister. So Kanata is like a little bit ahead of Rena, but I have Rena on my home screen because I like the outfit I have for her in All Stars a little better. Probably Kasumi. I mean, yeah. What can I say? Gremlins are really adorable. She's good. Mattis TB asks, will we, will we be getting any more DT Classics anytime soon? Those are my fave. Uh, at the moment right now, that's under NDA, so uh, I'm not allowed to say if we are or we aren't. So, uh. Absolutely. Uh, can I tell you what they are? Absolutely not, because uh, Stephanie would kill me if I leaked it, but we definitely will be getting some more classics soon. Short answer, yes. Um, Very much so. We're going to be doing more classics episodes. Just... I can't I'm not gonna tell you any more than that um I well maybe I will say you might see one in the next couple months from J2 Blue what is a Funimation dub in the past two three years that you think will be considered the best dub for years to come I think it's Fruits Basket I think that is the best dub with the most exposure and the biggest name recognition that that will be the one cited as the best for years to come a little further out but I would probably say Akka. It is just so well produced, you know? That show needs more love. Blood Blockade Battlefront. Blood Blockade Battlefront is the best recent dub that I have personally heard um, that I that I will stand by. I would say Sarah's on my. It's really good. It's vastly underrated. It's got singing in there. You guys should really go watch Sara's on my, even if Ikuhara is not your thing, just watch a couple episodes, maybe ones towards the end with, with Re- Reo and Mabu. Mm, you won't be disappointed in those. I'm going to say Dr. Stone, the new Fruits Basket anime, and hell, even Akudama Drive. I think those in particular are going to be more than just, okay, these are really good. I think these are going to be considered like the, wow, these are the actual, like, true masterpieces of the current decade like genuinely so i don't think it's going to get much play but the honey Bado dub in my opinion is absolutely fantastic i think everyone is extremely well cast uh i think it's well acted and i think it's well written and i i, I don't know if a lot of people are going to see it but i consider that one of funny's best dubs they've done in a long time that's going to have to be my hero academia i, I really think that uh, in the future, like in 10 years in the future, people are going to look back at the My Hero Academia dub as uh, probably the gold standard for what uh, good, solid, televisable English dubbing is supposed to look like. Not just because it's uh, done with a really great cast of uh, actors and actresses, which it definitely is, but also because there's so many of them. 
it's just insane how many I, I don't know any uh named actors who haven't been attached to that show yet and you now jumping into the the new season now there's probably more even Ooh, j2 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 you can't just simply pick any dub from the past two to three years hell my brain can't even go back the past two to three years right now <laughs> Well, if I had to guess, I'd say probably something like both three or smart down the, down the runway. Actually, Kakushi Goto, because Kakushi Goto was very fun and very challenging for both the viewers and the staff behind it. My Hero's up there, Fruits Basket's up there. Um, if they end up doubling Megalobox Nomad and bring back a lot of that original cast, plus mix in like new Funimation people... That's going to be up there if handled correctly. Maybe Skate the Infinity. It just depends. Um, I think Gridman should be in that discussion. I think the dub for, for Gridman is fucking fantastic. Uh, and I'll always shell out for Akka. I would say Akudama Drive is going to be a big one. Um, Dr. Stone, I think, will be a big one as well. Because it's a shonen and everybody loves shonen. Um, but the dub itself is actually really, really solid. I think it's one of the better like shonen um dubs that i've seen out that's not my hero academia i mean in terms of recent funny dubs that i think will stand the test of time uh, definitely the fruit basket reboot that dub it's been firing off all cylinders ever since it started pretty much everyone in it is doing a fantastic job and they're giving some of the best performances i've heard out of a lot of fun amazing regulars so as long as they set the landing and the show sets the landing which i mean I've heard nothing but good things about how it ends, so I imagine it probably will. I feel like that dub will probably go down as the new classic. It's really good. If I had my way, the No Guns Life dub would already be up there. I think that's a great show. I think that dub is super well put together, even if part of the reason I think that is because it is aggressively pandering to me personally. If I also had my druthers, I'd also think that, uh, I also wish that, like, Robbie Hachi could fit in there, because I think the Robbie Hachi dub is really funny, and I feel like that show didn't even get talked about all that much even while it was airing, even though I thought it was really just odd and strange and unique. Uh, and again, also aggressively pandering to me because it's literally just about a bunch of charlatans going on a road trip. Have you not seen the dub for Ravi Hachi? You should. It's extremely funny. I highly recommend it. I think some really good dubs that have come out lately. Uh, Wave Listen to Me was really good. Um, a Sleepy Princess in the Demon Castle is really good. Um, I don't think that they'll be like considered cult classics, but they'll just really, um, really, really solid productions. From Aizen Sosuke is, uh, what anime character do you think you would be best friends with? Have, have you ever guys seen the movie, uh, from Up on Poppy Hill? Uh, it was the second movie directed by Goro Miyazaki after the failure of Tales from Earthsea. And that movie, I really liked that all of the characters, like this wide cast of high school students in the 1960s were super ambitious about many different things. They, they were nerds, like they were nerdy students to be sure, but dang it, those were the kind of nerdy students that I would like to hang out with. Just uh, hang out in the Latin, Latin quarterly, putting it back together again, stopping bureaucrats from tearing it down while uh, having deep thoughts about the future of Japan and the country as a whole. Like that. that's the kind of movie where I saw that I'm like, it's not that it's you no know, fantastical to live in, but it's the kind of environment for that I would really enjoy just being a part of. Because who, who doesn't want to be a part of the ideal high school experience? A little late for that, obviously, being an adult. But, you know, there's still value, I think, in finding similarly ambitious individuals to remind yourself, what is it that you want to do with your life? And it's like, oh, I want to be ambitious and I want to make my dreams come true. So that's something I think we can all relate to. Uh, I think I get along very well with Honda-san, everyone's favorite skeleton bookseller, uh, since we both know the joys and horrors of selling manga and dealing with the kind of people who buys manga. Also, skeleton. Can't go wrong with that. <laughs> Love me a good skeleton. Oh, you know what? I probably would be best friends with... This is, an... this is um, one of my anime children that I have adopted as well. Uh, but I feel like I would be best friends with Chrome from Dr. Stone. <laughs> like, he's he's has so much high energy and very spunky. Um, and he's also a very curious person. And, like, 
such the sweetest noble person like uh, noble character i can think of off the top of my head and i feel like i would be fantastic friends with him if we given the chance probably all to kaisaki from real life because as i stated earlier me and him are kind of similar so i think i would be best friends with usopp or the cast of zombie land saga you know the legendary tied to kemi uh not to, the the legendary Tayamana. wow i my brain just farted, so yeah, the legendary Tayamada cast of Zombieland Saga, we would get along just fine. That's a hard one. Probably Lupin. I could see that. I kind of want to be friends with Regan from Mob Psycho. Sure, he's kind of a con artist, and he, you know, a bit of a jerk, but uh, he knows how to look out for people, and uh, he can definitely be responsible when he has to. And he's probably pretty good to his friends, you know, when it whatever friends he has, so, uh, yeah, break it. I'm going to say Monkey D. Luffy. Look at this face. How could you not be best friends with this face? He's just delightful. Probably Yamato Nikaido from Idolish 7. <laughs> if you don't know who that is, look him up. He's a boss. Coming hot off of Akadama Drive, even though being close to him would cause me personal damage to my health, I would really like to just chill out with Brawler. Like, I think we would be bros. I can't say Kashu because I don't think Kashu would put up with my bullshit. I'd probably end up being like really good friends with like Super Milk Chan or something. Uh, I might probably be pretty good friends with like uh, with Gallo because I'm pretty I'm pretty dumb like Gallo from Promare. Ian Thurston asks, "Is there a dub actor you feel is heavily overlooked?" They also name drop Aaron Roberts, who is a great answer that I am going to seal. Like him in uh, Fire Force is just a fantastic uh, performance. And when I see his name in cast announcements, I think, nice, good for him. Marcus Stimmick is criminally underrated. I want him so bad to get a, uh, a lead role. He's just got a, such a strong, unique voice that is different from everyone out there. And um, he's just, he, he's got this this voice that just booms and, 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 and it makes makes his presence known and i really like to see him get a lead role sometime a dub actor that i feel is heavily overlooked uh marcus stimmick marcus stimmick is amazing and uh deserves more roles especially after uh assassination classroom just marcus stimmick amazing i'd like to see kasser muhammad in more stuff I, I think she did a really great job in Great Pretender, and it, it would be really cool to see her do more things, either with, you know, NYAV Post for more Netflix stuff, or just, in general, just showing up every now and again. Would be cool. Uh, Garrett Storms. Nobody likes him but Megan. I think he's a great actor when given the right direction. If uh, Tekken Rambo Hanamaru, Black Clover, and Stars Align haven't ever actually, like, given you an inkling of how much of a good actor he is. I feel like I'd have a different answer if you asked me again, but he still hasn't really played any anime leads besides Waver, so I guess I'd say maybe Lucian Dodge. Uh, he's got a pretty good vocal range, and his work is usually pretty good, so I'd like to see him in bigger roles more often. Uh, the one that comes to mind for myself is actually Cynthia Martinez. Now, Cynthia has been around for a long time. She's been around since like the late 90s in the dubbing sphere. And she has a very easily recognizable voice. And I'm sure people who are listening to this and they're like, I know who Cynthia is. And that's great. I'm glad that you do know who she is. But because she's restricted to dubbing in just the Houston area, like we only hear her in ADV or Sentai dubs. We, I, I, she does not get nearly as much work as I feel like she should. And, you know, she does an amazing job with her very distinct voice. And she can do both comedic and dramatic voices as well. That is the kind of uh, talent that I would like to really see stretched out to other studios. You know, like, especially now that we're living in the era of everybody can dub from their home, we could really use some more recognition for one Cynthia Martinez. I would say Howard Wang. He's fantastic. And like I've said before, I could listen to him read the phone book. I guess if I'm being honest, I'd say Chris Gardner simply because... His role in Hakata to Kotsu Amis was so cool, and I'm so upset we never got to talk about him. But that's for different reasons. I really hope he, I really hope he gets to be in a, another big role like that again. My brain is defaulting to Ben Phillips right now, honestly. 
I feel like he's been around for a while and done. he's done some consistently great work, but he just doesn't get enough attention when it feels like he should. Like, especially, just go watch Golden Kamoy and you'll get to appreciate the bullshit that he does as Shiraishi. It's hilarious and it's amazing. Also, I'm going to once again call out my buddy Katie. Uh, she told me that Shiraishi, Ben Phillips Shiraishi sounds like Fred from Scooby-Doo and I can't unhear it now. God fucking damn it. Anyways, yes, Ben Phillips is hugely overlooked. Uh, he's really good. Uh, quite a few, to be honest. Uh, like, I have, a, I have a fondness for actors and actresses who I feel like often don't get cast in lead roles all that often, just because, um, you know, the sort of character types you find in anime uh, don't lend themselves to their natural vocal range all that well. Uh, usually my go-to is probably, like, Mark, Mark Stimak, who I think is very talented. Um, but he, he has that vocal range that, like, this is not a vocal range that gets you a lot of lead roles in anime, unfortunately. Uh, and I think you'll get there one day, I hope. Um... But yeah, there's, there's, I think there's just a whole cast who are like sort of perennially get put as side characters just because like that's that's not how they talk. Uh, how they talk is not how anime characters look. I'm actually gonna say Jared Green. Uh, Jared Green, who you would know as probably in terms of recent stuff, uh, he is back as um, Hitoshi Shinzo uh, in My Hero Academia. He's also he's also done quite a few other shows such as Nanbaka. He did I haven't seen it, but Hida Matsuri. He he's been around for a while. He started, but he started kind of getting I think a bit more like named roles and more major roles about almost like four, like five, six years ago when the podcast started because we have Grimgar, um, Ashes and Illusions. Uh, where he was uh, Mogazo, and Mogazo is just a sweet, gentle giant, and it's just so precious. Um, Jared, Jared's range, the tone is more deeper, like baritone, almost bass level. It can also work for various roles. Like I, like he's made it work for Shinzo. He makes it work for Shinzo. He makes it work for Mogazo. I just really, really love Jared Green as an actor, and I wish he had. He got more love and appreciation. Ellie Brennan asks, What are the dubs that you guys feel are the worst of all time? Gonna be real here. Bad dubs are actually kind of fun to watch. And I don't think that's the answer you're really looking for. If you want the most disappointing dubs I've ever, you know, ever watched. um, I would have to say... Penguin Drum and Kids on the Slope. Bunch of great actors being absolutely misused in great, great source material. So, yeah, I would have to say either Penguin Drum or Kids on the Slope. They'd probably be about even for me. Uh, my least favorite dub is Revolutionary Girl Utena. It's just old. It doesn't work. It makes me cringe that such a bad dub went on one of my favorite shows of all time. This is a little hard to answer just because for me, it would be a lot of dubs that are almost considered comical, like the big green dub for Dragon Ball Z, where everyone's just completely miscast. I remember listening to some of the early Pat Labor um, dubs, and I just couldn't get into it because the dub was really not good at all. Everybody just sounded so flat and confused and just... Not at all like they knew what they were doing. So maybe some of the early Pat Labor stuff. Now for many of these, you're just going to get the off-the-cuff answer from me. Like these answers change by the day. And I'm not holding strongly to any one of them in particular. But So let me put it this way. The Ghost Stories dub gets actively worse every time I read a comment that says Ghost Stories is the best dub of all time. I'll admit, I haven't watched a lot of bad or terrible dubs that I hate that strongly, but I'm going to pick a more general one. Ghost Stories. It's not because I don't find it funny or that I probably wouldn't get a couple of laughs out of it even if I watched it today, but it feels like every time it comes up in conversation, every conversation about anime dubs just regresses like 20 years. We, as a society, have evolved past ghost stories' edgy humor, but it's always being held as one of the only good dubs. And 
every comment on any funny comedic anime scene is like, wow, it's just like ghost stories. So in regards to societal impact, um, ghost story takes this one. It feels like it's done a lot more harm than good to the conversation of anime dubs. Um, I have to say the great teacher Onizuka dub is the worst that I've heard of. Like, I don't watch a lot of bad dubs. I haven't heard some of the legendary um, So Bad It's Good ones. But but Great Teacher Onizuka, just, if you haven't seen the sub yet, it really, really impacts in a negative way. Like, I think it takes away all of the heart and impact of those scenes. It's just not very good. Um, so yeah, Great Teacher Onizuka, not a good dub, unfortunately. Uh, I don't really know anymore. Um, most of the dubs I feel like I've seen in the last, like, like seven, you know, basically since starting this podcast have usually been, like, pretty solid. Like, if they're not great, it's usually because the show that's a dub of is not great rather than, the, like, the actual dubbing. Uh, to be honest, I haven't watched any of, like, kind of the classic bad dubs all that recently to really, like, have a strong opinion on them anymore. Like, I guess Garzy's Wing is still pretty bad. Like, it's definitely one of those kind of, like, 80s early to mid 90s dubs were like you know they dubbed stuff it didn't really feel like people cared put that much effort and care into it um so it's probably something in there but i couldn't really i haven't watched any of them long enough to really have a strong feeling uh and don't say mad bull 34 the dub on that is great it's the exact dub that show should have uh worst dub i've personally seen would probably be the miami dub of ico incarnation just really stiff and wooded all across the board Except for, I guess, maybe Christina Jopley as I go. I thought she sounded pretty... Or I thought she could have sounded pretty good if she was directed better. Uh, it's kind of a shame that dubs are not so bad, since apparently Netflix didn't use any of the actors' retakes, and it might have sounded better if they had, but... Uh, either way, the magazine dub is simply a huge improvement, and I don't think I'd ever listen to the Miami version again, so... Oh, God. <laughs> um... The only recent, like, the only thing that's coming to mind for me right now in terms of recent ones that are just plain awful um, is Nakaimo, My Sisters Among Them. If you watched that episode that we did for Val our Valentine's Day special this year, um, you know exactly why this, the show itself is awful and the dub itself is, just, it didn't do it any favors. Uh, it's not one of those where I can say the the dub is better than what the show deserved, honestly. It's one of the more not-so-fantastic dubs uh, from Sentai back in, like, the mid-2010s. Uh, but I would say, for right now, i say Nakaimo. Personally, Dramatical Murder ranks up there pretty fucking high. Uh, Nakaimo is a very close second, but those two are, are genuinely what the uh, I consider the worst two dubs to be that I've ever heard. For this century's dubs, I, I gotta say, the, the thing that really disappointed me the most, and it's probably the poorest example of a dub that I've heard in this century, like in the digital age, was Elfin Lead. You know, I know that Elfin Lead is not the best reputation when it comes to, like, content quality or anything like that. You know, it's, it's schlocky, and it's very... Uh, not, not something you'd want to show to your children, obviously, but even taking that into account, I still enjoy the show, but the dub itself just did not get the emotions that went into it. Like, it was not anywhere near the level of quality that that show needed to be to come across as believable, and I always watch that show in Japanese. I cannot do that one in English, and it's really... Uh, I haven't seen a dub over the last... that was made in, like, the last 10 to 15 years that really feels lower than that one so yeah elfin lead is not a good dub by any stretch of the imagination definitely stick to the japanese on that one well for the longest time there was the show called angel Links, which was this sort of spin-off to outlaw star that had just an awful awful dub recorded by the blue ocean group but uh currently my most hated dub right now is easily the english dub for seasons one and two of wakfu because not only is it an absolutely horrible dub, but it was funded with a Kickstarter. The fact that I actually paid money for this thing to exist just burns my very soul. Like, I just absolutely cannot stand it. Thankfully, Netflix picked it up, and for season three, they dubbed it in L.A. with a much better cast. So, but yeah, the first two seasons of Walk Fu were intolerable. 
Well, you may have seen it in one of my dubbies as well as we did an episode on it, that is the reflection. Because for one thing, if you do not have experience in this medium, the dub could come off very awkward when you first record it. I know everybody has to start from somewhere, but the reflection was not it. Although I'm glad for a few key people that came out of that. I'm very proud of Layla Bursons for her effort in the dub. I do really think she was one of the standouts, but overall, that show was just a hot mess. Next question is from Savannah M on YouTube, and I'm also going to include at Bright at Bright Eyes five hundred five on Twitter. Hello, Beth, because um, she also asked a similar question. Um, so Savannah says. Congrats on 5,000. I've been here since before 1,000, and I love it so much. Oh, stop. So cute. Um, I wanted to ask for the whole group, what has been your favorite episode of the Dub Talk podcast to record and why? Thank you very much, and keep being the amazing people you are. First of all, very, very sweet. Um, I'm going to – you ask a hard one because there's so many episodes that I love doing. Um, I would say any of the ones that – Either I did extra legwork leg work research for, like, um, for instance, oh, I'm blanking. Uh, Rambo Keaton Game of La Place, uh, Paranoid Agent is another one I really love doing, and um, Gosick as well. Uh, those three, um, in terms of things that I like, had to dig deeper in and research. Um, but then there are also episodes that I was really passionate about um, that involved some of probably my favorite shows, Paranoid Agent again is another one um well Srain is another one that i really really loved uh that's a good question for me it's probably a toss-up between the karate high episode because it's a really fun show and i really like talking about it and it's very silly uh or as a tie the angels of death episode and the apare ranman episode because both of them allow me to ramble on about completely unrelated topics that only i find interesting and i'm very happy when i get to do that in the episodes uh because i get to have fun and everyone listening gets to be confused and wonder what the fuck i'm talking about always a fun time just from as a critic my favorite episode that i have done is yuri on ice i think i was at my strongest at that point um, not to say that my later reviews haven't been up to that level of quality, but I, I feel like I just hit the nail on the head with that one. Um, just in terms of my favorite fun episode, um, I gotta say it's Dragon Quest Your Story. Getting Andrew to sit down, watch it, completely unaware of the twist that happens at the end of the movie... And I, I had to have Steph Lilac um, record his reactions, and I actually included it in the edit of the episode. And I thought that was really great. I guess probably the favorite episode to record would be the Kato episode, because me and the guys were being anybody but ourselves at that moment. Like, I was, we were pretending to be sports personalities. I was Stephen A. Smith, which, if you ever heard Stephen A. Smith, that man is boisterous beyond belief. But if you want, like, a serious answer, I'd probably say something along the lines of Magical Girl Razor Project, because that also took a dark turn with, with things, and it's kind of really hard to express even in that time. My favorite episode to record has probably got to be I No Kusabi. It was the first screener we'd ever received. It was something that I was really passionate about. We literally talked about every named character in there, got to shout out a bunch of voice actors who weren't well known and who were kind of starting out at the time. I just, and it's BL. <laughs> I just, I loved it so much. I'm, I'm happy that we got to do that episode and then it came together and it also came together in like less than a week like real quick turnaround time which if you guys don't know behind the scenes a lot of our episodes take weeks and weeks to turn around and we like dumped that out in less than a week and I'm super proud of it and I love it so much it's such a, a great a great thing I love Aino Kusabi this one that you're listening to right now because I never get to record anything for this podcast uh well, let me just modify this a bit to talk about editing. Uh, and I think one of the most fun I've had uh, editing-wise is Promare. 
I went hard on that one. I ended up doing a lot of different gags. I did some interesting transitions effects. Uh, this is the first time I attempted to do anything with motion tracking. It was fun and interesting and uh, a lot of work. So yeah, I think that's my answer to the question that you didn't ask. I know there's the episode I'm most proud about, and I think somebody else asked me that question. Like, most fun to do? Uh, any of the any of the Valentine's episodes are usually pretty fucking fun to do, especially um, anytime I get to drink alcohol an episode. So Handshakers was a ton of fun because I was smashed. The Love Live episode, the Love Live movie episode, was a ton of fun to do. Um, it's just a lot. There's a lot of really fun ones. I couldn't. It would take me hours to go through. I have to like also just think of a lot of them. Diamond Dollar and the Island of Giant Insects was a ton of fun too, as well. For me personally, some of my favorite episodes to record, ironically enough, are the Valentine's Day episodes where I get to suffer for your enjoyment. And I'm not just being sarcastic about that. Like, legitimately, I do look forward to that uh, once a year. Uh, what, what what are the girls going to think of this year? Uh, dread. Because it's always something that we always have fun talking about. Even if the material itself is not any fun. Like, this year's uh, selection was not a fun show by any means but i did enjoy talking about it and you know even though a lot of the times we pick stuff that's fun to talk about because we enjoy the content every once in a while it's fun to pick something that's just bonkers i'm personally pretty proud of the dub talks that that were for anime and anime dubs that really like emotionally resonate with me because i almost feel like i i have a responsibility to like sell these shows and, like, really get into, like, what makes them tick, as well as really highlight, like, the quality of performances. That's That stuff, like, March Comes In Like a Lion, A si Silent Voice, O oh Maidens in Your Savage Season, Anohana, Makuya, stuff like that. Like, it's very satisfying to, like, analyze those, and I feel really proud of talking about those dubs in particular. But, honestly, if you want to talk about, like, what are my favorite episodes to record... Like, any time I can talk about f fucking Fate anime with Team Grimgar, it's just a ton of fun. There are t uh, three that I really, really love, that I'm really proud of, that I was part to be of. Um, the first one was Pop Team Epic, because all of us got to be on it in certain, and, uh, in certain capacity. And, uh, and it's just like this sort of a group effort that uh, we... we took a brand new approach to that episode and it's never been quite the same and, and we've never had never done anything like it before so that's what I'm really proud of uh, Star Blazers had probably the most chill group of of of, uh, of reviewer of, of, of hosts rather um, that we all just gelled really good it had some great one liners and we just everything flowed so good and I really love that episode and then most recently, Gunsmith Cats, mainly because that is a show that is very near and dear to my heart. And I got to team up with my two awesome uh, ladies and uh, and we just it was just so much fun reliving that. And, uh, and yeah, so those three pop team, Star Blazers and Gunsmith Cats. Who? what was my favorite? I'm trying. To, I think it was the one I hosted way back when on Gamers. That was really, really fun. I love that one. Uh, favorite dub talk episode to record was probably Tiger and Bunny. Uh, it's one of my favorite dubs in general, and I really like that show a lot, so I'm glad I got to talk about it. And uh, to get some of the others to check it out for the first time, too, so doing that one was a lot of fun. Uh, what was one that we had a lot of fun? Uh, I, I remember having a lot of fun doing the uh, Empire of Corpses dub. That was just really fun. Uh, we, we, got to, we got to just joke around. It, it was... And we, we all really enjoyed the anime, so we all had a good time talking about it. So, yeah, I'd say, like, Empire of Corpses. Uh, Michael Schomer asks, What do you think is better, Fate Zero or Unlimited Blade Works, and why? And I regret to say, I the Fate Zero is the only Fate thing I have actually seen, except for that one, like, um, spinoff about cooking that I saw an episode once at a con. Uh, Fate Zero is great, um, but I can't really compare it to Unlimited Blade Works because I haven't seen it, so... Uh, Fate Zero kind of wins by default until I watch more Fate stuff. I have only finished two completion Fate Zero, therefore I will say Fate Zero. <laughs> I've only ever watched Fate Zero, and I got to uh, confess I'm not a big Fate fan. 
Uh, but Fate Zero, uh, I do enjoy Waver and Ryder and their interactions. But uh, other than that, yeah, that's the wrong. Per I'm the wrong person to ask. Uh, I have not seen any of the Fate franchise. I think I saw like one episode of Unlimited Blade Works when it was first coming out, and I don't remember any of it. But to give an answer here, I will go ahead and say that Unlimited Blade Works is my favorite, solely because we got to reference it uh, at A-Fest 2018 when we pelted Spaceman Hardy with beans, and we got to call it Unlimited Beans Works. That title alone got worked into one of my favorite moments of that trip. So for that reason alone, Unlimited Blade Works gets my point. Now I'm going to go watch the Fate franchise in a couple of years and look back and I'm like, eh, I probably should have said something different. I got to say Zero. It's a really gripping, tighter narrative to me. Like, Unlimited Blade Works, it's also great, but it's great in different ways than I think Zero is. But to me, I feel like Zero makes me care and a lot more attached to what happens in Unlimited Blade Works. And I don't feel the reverse would be true. I don't feel like Unlimited Blade Works would make me more attached to Zero. But I think Zero made me more attached to Unlimited Blade Works. And that's why I personally feel Zero is the stronger of the two. Uh, Zero, because it's better written. It's better written, it has a better dub. And I would die for a way for Velvet. Julie W also posts uh, another group question. What is some anime that you really wish could get an English dub? Sinful Gear, first and foremost, because ever since I found out about some of the amazing things in Sinful Gear, I was, <laughs> I was hoping to get it up eventually, when Disco Tech announced it was coming out, I was, I was surprised, because it's not getting dubbed, and then I understand why, but, you know, you win some, you lose some. I'm gonna say the Gurren Lagann movies, they, they deserve the dub treatment, but there's a lot of good anime out there, and I can't think of off the top of my head. A lot of the stuff that's locked up in Crunchyroll's backlog right now, but uh, probably played it with. It was such a cool little mecha show. It kind of managed to compress the plot of a 52-episode mecha epic into just 12 without really missing anything. And it's got a really good heart. I really like more folks to see it, and it would kind of be a shame if it just sat on Crunchyroll's site forever, so it would never really help with that. Maybe someday. I know it, Andrew's going to say... Either laid back camp or universe. Oh, dude. Okay. I'm just going to give you my current top five. Uh, given, please tell me Galco Chan, Recreators, Laid Back Camp, and a place further than the universe. Uh, I kind of hope Fairy Ron Maru gets an anime just because that's saving anime right now, and I like to see men scream. I like to see straight guys squeal. Uh, no, I do not hate straight men. I hate a very specific set of straight men. Oh, I'll say Given, because I really want to watch Given, and it and it can give me an excuse to watch it. The one show right now that I really want to have an English dub, but I think it's going to be inevitable at this point, is Moriarty the Patriot. Like, based on the summary and everything like that, it's, again, my brand of shit, my brand of bullshit. And I've actually recently started reading the manga, too, and I just really, really love this different kind of take on the Sherlock Holmes lore and story. Um... And I, I haven't seen the show yet. I have not watched the anime yet. I'm at this point waiting for the eventual dub that I'm pretty sure is bound to happen. Please, Funimation, let's get this one dubbed, okay? Um, I'd love to see Banana Fish get an English dub. Uh, I think it would really lean well towards an English dub. Pretty much a lot of the stuff that's on Amazon Prime, I didn't realize until recently that Dororo is actually getting a dub, which I'm pretty excited to see about that. The standalone series is a uh, really nice uh, kind of slice of life series called Sweetness and Lightning. People who haven't heard of it before, it's about a single father who's uh, also a teacher full time and has to basically learn how to uh, cook healthy meals for his daughter. And the precariousness of her character mixed with the like domestic sweetness of his uh, just trying to be a better father and the young lady who eventually helps them become enamored with how to cook properly is just like really the kind of thing that I wish would get more exposure. And I think that a dub would help do that. My personal dub wish list includes uh, Udino Prince Sama, which is very a heated discussion, but I, I just want it to have one to have one. And Idolish 7, because I think it can really benefit from getting one for more people to watch it over here. Space Adventure Cobra, both the original uh, 1980s series and the OVA series that uh, ran about 10 or so years ago. 
I mean, Kaiji for one. Man, if I could just slip a couple presidential flashcards under Suntai Filmworks' door with, you know, a little note that said Dub Kaiji, yeah, I'd totally do that. Um, I guess House of Five Leaves would also be another one that I would say I'd absolutely love a dub for. You know what? It would also be cool if we could somehow get, like, an updated dub for uh, Dirty Pair. Because I know the movies in OVAs got it, the show didn't. It would be kind of cool to see that. J2 Blue asks, with remote dubbing being a thing, do you think this will become a standard practice in getting different actors from different parts of the world to improve diversity in casting? Do you think it has so far? Uh, I really hope it does because we really need, you know, more actors, more people getting jobs and getting to show their talents with the world. I think it's helped a lot. And I think it's mostly been shown from smaller dubbing studios like Sound Cadence is one, um, Coach of Sound, ones that have the ability to get more people from across the country and even in other countries in order to dub anime and i think that's really a good thing and i hope it continues i absolutely think remote dubbing is now um part of the standard uh now that covid is sort of getting curved and the actors are starting to go back into the studio to dub it really is going to depend on the director and the actor's availability, what they're comfortable with. Because I can see a lot of uh, directors going back to the same old, same old, safe, easy choices. But I also see some of the new directors sort of wanting to uh, branch out. Like, you take a difference, the difference between the Akudama dub and the Wave Listen to Me dub. Akudama is just like, let's freaking go. Let's go as wild as we can. Let's pull in everybody we can. Whereas Wave Listen to Me is mostly funny regulars who have all been doing that it's a very very safe cast and yet both dubs are very well done and they both set out to accomplish and i think it's really going to depend on what the directors and the actors are comfortable with uh as far as how much remote dubbing is going to play in the future but i definitely think it's here and it's here to stay i actually do think it's working i don't know about becoming the standard because that is not my department to talk about but i do think it has improved diversity so far i mean we've extended the reach worldwide beyond belief yes i think it's going to become more of a standard practice and because and it's work it's work so far um arte is a he is a very very big example of this um because you have um you have sound canis that went out of their way to cast um italian american actors who live in the texas area who live in la who live in new york and you have gianni as well who plays leo who is from freaking canada uh, and then you have another example, Sleepy Princess in the Demon Castle, where you have uh, an Australian actress in there. And you also have an actor or two who currently live in England as well um, as part of the cast. So I think it works and I really would love for it to become a standard uh, in future dubs to come. The only drawback, um, and I mentioned this in the Arte episode, is it's it's becoming a standard only in one region and that's texas i i've seen this brought up in conversation and i also i share this opinion too i would love for it to become a standard in other regions as well um like it sometimes occasionally happens in the new york area sometimes um and then the la area it's not extremely often that it happens so i would love for it to become more of a bigger standard across the board not just in one region man i hope so we talk a lot about getting the best person for the job, which goes hand in hand with auditions and opening that up to the most amount of people. I think it has broken a lot of notions of what is and is not possible, but you can't discount the value of recording in a booth with a director and an engineer there. It is still a unnecessary extra amount of effort to record someone remotely that you have to be able to justify. Uh, I think it definitely has, case in point, in the Gleepnir episode, we point out that one of the actors is based in the UK, which, like, that is not a thing I think you would have seen uh, in an American-produced dub, like, just a year prior, even. Um, and, like, I think I think remote dubbing like that is great. Like, I think it's great that you can pull in actors from, like, you're, you're, in theory, your pool is only as big as, like, can you find somebody who has 
an appropriate recording setup, great, they can be in stuff. Um, that said, I don't... I'm curious to know what the future of it is, because I could see an instance where... And this depends a lot on, like, which company you're looking at, because I think even, even currently you can see variety within... Uh, companies as far as like how they treat dubbing at home. I can see some who will continue to do that even when you know doing in-person dubbing is more feasible again and I can see ones who once uh, in-person dubbing is feasible again start to pull back on that and it's like we want to stick to our geographically local pool and barring like certain specific instances they might not be interested in doing uh, at home recording. Uh, I hope that sticks around as a trend though. I think that's been good for dubbing in general and I think having larger acting pools in general is just better for the industry as a whole. I'm not sure about diversity necessarily, but I do think this is going to become a standard practice uh, as it's shown that it is possible. And in many ways, aside from maybe some technical issues, I think it is more convenient for uh, studios because scheduling, I imagine, is easier. Uh, I'm not going to sit here and pretend like I know all the ins and outs of the dubbing industry, but it does seem like remote dubbing is more convenient for everyone. And the fact that it is accessible to make your own studio, uh, to make your own booth, I, I think that's helping a lot. And I think it is going to make things easier in a lot of ways, especially uh, depending on certain licenses. If, you know, say a studio gets a license for a dub that, or a license for an anime that's already been dubbed in a different, like, studio that they might be able to bring in some of the actors. I actually do think, to an extent, it has helped Dubcast, particularly in the Dallas area, sort of diversify a bit. Do I think it will be a standard in terms of actual dub production once, you know, we're out of the pandemic era? Um, I don't know. I, I think we're going to largely go back to the studio-based system, but I also feel like for all the investment that had to be put into remote dubbing, I don't think it's going to entirely go away. It would definitely help keep the number of dubs up, but, you know, you also need engineers, you also need writers and directors and whatnot, so who knows? We'll see. I think it has a lot, but I only think that's really happened with stuff that Funimation itself has put out. Or, like, Funimation has helped produce through sound we, with the help of mostly, I think, Sound Cadence and Koja. Uh, they themselves have, have brought in actors from other places before, like Titan, My Hero Academia, um, even stuff like Diamond Dollar, and I think, like, Aquarion and, and Garo had, had a lot of that stuff. But I think the bigger thing is I want to see more California dubs branch out into this, specifically stuff from Studiopolis. Because, I'll be real with you, I don't think that... I, I'm not particularly on the episode for Jujutsu Kaisen if it ever happens. I think it's inexcusable that, like, Jujutsu Kaisen has double-triple casting in it. Or, like, um, My Life as a Villainess. I don't think that... I think that that needs to be improved out in the California scene. To answer that question, in theory, it definitely should be. Um, I mean, we've definitely seen a lot of uh, dubs that have pulled in... California talent into Texas dubs. We've seen vice versa, Texas actors performing in California dubs. We've seen uh, performances that brought in international talent as well. Uh, and I don't think that's going to change. Uh, even though we're kind of restricted from having people gather in large groups now due to the human malware, there is not really an incentive to change that once that goes away. Now, that being said, anybody who's worked in theater and has uh, auditioned for stuff before knows that not everyone is comfortable with that. There are probably still going to be some casting directors and studios that are just not comfortable uh, having people uh, essentially supervise themselves. There's going to be some hesitation towards that. Um, in an ideal world, obviously, I'd say, yes, absolutely, cut down the barrier of if you're not here physically, then you can't perform for us, and let people uh, with adequate equipment, obviously, adequate equipment and professional uh, acting chops be a part of the production. But that's really hard to do, and right now everyone's kind of uh, forced to do that. I do hope that that becomes the norm going forward. But again, if you're familiar with how theater or any kind of professional acting assignment works, don't be surprised if studios are more hesitant to embrace that culture full-time once uh, things start to open back up again. We'd hope that they would 
uh, continue to allow people to work remotely. But again, it may take a little longer for them to adapt it full time. God, I really hope so. Like, like, like you can definitely tell which studios have fully embraced, like, have fully embraced this. Which ones are dipping their toes a little, but they're not quite comfortable jumping into the pool. And you can very much see which studios are just not even attempting. Like, to me, global remote casting is just the best thing to come out of this shitty pandemic. Like, every dub, to, every dub that's come out of, like, Sound Cadence, Kocha, hell, even, like, a couple of, like, Funimation simul dubs over the past season or two, it's been a lot of really fascinating, like, coastal blending of the talent, and it's just... It's been really cool. I, I really liked all the, uh, like, the chances that they've been taking on some of these. I think it's really made for some really fresh, exciting, and genuinely great dubs because of it. I really hope that people stick with this as the norm instead of just rolling it back and sticking in your coast once everybody gets vaccinated. I think that'd be a huge missed opportunity. I do think remote recording is probably going to become a much more common practice, even when things fully go back to normal. I mean, it's just too too useful to not do that. Uh, hopefully it is used a little bit more for diversity, uh, but that's something that will also probably depend on, you know, directors, casting directors, and producers. So uh, hopefully they make the right calls on that because we can definitely use a lot more of it. I ask to everyone, including myself, how do you like your tacos? At, At least it's not the fucking, fucking hot dog question. question. Personally, for me, if I'm getting like Taco Bell, it's just basically meat and cheese. I don't like lettuce. Um, I occasionally put some some tomatoes or sour cream every once in a while. If I'm doing like fancy tacos, what uh, I, it's a place called Elwood Shack in Memphis has some fish tacos that it's, uh, I think it's called Stone Trout. And man, they are the most delicious things I have ever eaten. And I say that as someone who has eaten food from around the world, they are amazing. If you are in Memphis, you have got to try them. It's uh, definitely spicy with extra cheese and no tomatoes. Not a tomato person. From Taco Bell. <laughs> I can't say that anymore. <laughs> like I've like enriched myself with the culture of fuzzies. <laughs> If you're in Texas, y'all know fuzzies tacos, soft shell, flour, brisket, no onions. Mm. It's 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 a thing of beauty, fam. Well, you know, um, my in-laws are Hispanic, and you're gonna be like, well, what does that mean? That means that uh, if you don't have Hispanic relatives, you probably haven't had tortillas that have to be charred before you can eat them. Uh, like I grew up when I was younger, where if you wanted tacos, you just toss the the shells in the microwave to warm them up so they are warm and soft but now i've gotten way more accustomed to taking the taco either flour or corn tortilla and turning on the gas stove and just kind of charring both sides of it so that's fully cooked and you get a little bit of that extra grill portion to it and then once you do that you stuff that thing with meat onions tomatoes lettuce cheese sour cream and salsa just stuff that thing as far as it will go that that to me my good friend is a really good taco mm. getting hungry now i'll be right back i like my tacos uh with steak with cheese um i love lots of sour cream and it has to have um just an abundance of beef and cheese just has to have it hardy i regret to inform you that i don't really eat tacos i have nothing against them uh, it's just, if I'm at a Mexican place, I would rather get a burrito or nachos or a torta. I've just never super been into tacos, so I don't really have a preferred style because I don't really eat them. Sorry, man. And yes, I will take you up on whatever restaurant you want to take me in Memphis to, to change my mind. I'm, I'm down for, I'm always down for good eating. I don't have my phone on me, but I, I like to eat from a place in, near me called Capital Tacos, and I fucking love the, the Dr. Fauci's order of taco, so just look that up. We had tacos a couple nights ago. Uh, nothing too complex here. I think I prefer soft shell tacos. You got meat, lettuce, uh, red peppers, onion, sour cream, and a bit of cheese. I feel my taste is very basic. I loved soft shell tacos. I like 
packing them in like i'm packing in like a sandwich i guess is the way to describe it so i'll do like the lettuce first then the ground beef and then tomatoes and then the cheese like i am a plain jane i don't like hot sauces i am such a freaking plain jane it's not even funny from mastro zavrik i have a question for everyone do you have a top two male say you yeah my top two male say you are uh natsuki Haine is number one and uh ona kensho is my second Tomokazu Sugita is definitely up there for me. He's, I loved, I loved his work as Gundam Tanaka when I was, uh, back when Danganronpa used to not be so easily accessible. Like, I was watching a lot of videos of the trials and stuff. I adore, uh, Sugita's, uh, Gundam Tanaka. I'm also gonna give props to Nobuhiko Okamoto, because... I don't think I adore everything he's done, but that dude has a lot more range than we give him credit for. Like, everybody knows him as the <sighs> kind of guy, but no, he's got some versatility to his range. I was, like, genuinely shocked when I found out he plays Sengoku in Horror Me. I was like, what? No fucking way. I don't follow Japanese voice actors that much. Like, there are definitely names that I recognize. Um, but not well enough that I can, like, pick them out without, like, some prompting or looking at a cast list. Uh, I do know that I usually enjoy Mamoru Miyano when I hear him and stuff, uh, because he's really good at just being over the top, see, you know, Zombieland Saga or something like that. Uh, and I'm also, I like it when, uh, Norio Wakamoto gets hired to do funny stuff, like when he's in Azumanga Daio and he gets to use that, like, preposterous bass voice to, you know, voice this weird cartoon cat character. Uh, so I like it when, he's, he's a good advice actor in general, but I do like it when they cast him as, like, you know, ironic counterpoint to his voice, rather than, you know, like, you know, uh, the guy he plays in Code Geass, which is like, well, of course that actor, that character sounds like that, look at him. That's, that's just correct, that's just correct casting. Akira Ishida and Hiroyuki Yoshida. Akira Ishida has done a lot of pretty boys and villains over the years, like Kaiwu from Ava or Gara from Naruto. Uh, but it's good at just about everything, and his performance in Showa Rocket Rocket goes into especially like some of the best voice acting I've ever heard, period. And I almost recommend the show itself just for his performance, but uh, seriously, go watch the show up. Again, Roku Rocket goes into it's It's a really good show. And uh, as for Hiroyuki Yoshino, he's just really good at playing scruffy anime boys and kind of giant hands like Favro and Marisa Bahamut. And his performances are always a lot of fun, so I really like his work. I don't really listen to a lot of Japanese tracks. And so I don't really have a favorite male seiyuu, but one person, one guy that absolutely comes to mind and I have infinite respect for is definitely Norio Wakamoto. I think he is just amazing, as has been for ever since he's come out. He's just awesome. I feel like I would have a more interesting answer if we weren't just talking about male seiyuu. Uh, but I'm going to say Tomikazu Sugita, who's, you know, Gin from Gintama. The best slash worst Jojo uh, in Joseph Joestar and Katakuri in One Piece. As for a second one, all the great male performances I'm thinking of in Japanese are like, oh, that was Miano. That was Miano. That was Miano. So the answer is Miano. Yes. Uh, Gigi Seiyu Corner. Me and Megan, we have our own Seiyu Corner. Uh, mine, obviously, is Tomaki Maeno, who voices Kamu. That's my number one of all time, Kamu and Udino Prince-sama. I also love Mamoru Miyano and Shota Aoi. Basically, if they're an Udapri, I stand them. It's it's a thing, fam. It's a mm, GG Seiyu Corner, yes. Samuraiko also asks, for any all of you, what's your all-time favorite dub? Acting and writing and direction are all just chef's kiss and why is it your all-time favorite something i really value personally is naturalistic dialogue like there's good banter good back and forth and there's not a lot of uh overly pronounced words and enunciation and perfect diction and my go-to example of this has always been uh the girl who leapt through time which i've always thought is a really great dub they cast a teenage actor in the lead role, which was an interesting choice that leads to a more authentic and natural sounding performance. Typically, you don't need to go that authentic with a uh, teenage role, but I thought that was a nice touch. I've already answered this. It's Cowboy Bebop. I know it's showed its age, but I still consider it the greatest dub of all time, not because it's perfect, because it's not, but because it was the catalyst for people to start realizing hey dubs don't always suck 
this is actually really good. And I think 20 years later, going back to it, it still holds up. It's still a solid, solid effort. And, uh, and anyone, it's not the big gateway drug that it used to be, but I still think it can still pull its fair share of newbies in. And uh, I just, I love it to death. So, uh, my all time favorite dub right now is love stage. I will put a placeholder here for another dub because I, there's one that's in direct competition with it and it will probably be found out in a future episode. Um, and my third one was Kodocha, but I feel that I can't comment on that critically right now because I haven't seen it in a really long time and Discotech's going to re-release it. But Love Stage is right now my favorite dub of all time just because of all the care that got put into it and all the love and the acting is great. The writing is amazing. Guys, just go watch Love Stage. It's so good. Definitely got to say Monster. Uh, the whole thing is just really filled with a lot of great dramatic performances. Uh, pretty much everyone in that cast knocked it out of the park. And just gave a lot of humanity to even some of its most complex and twisted characters. Uh, except Johan. Johan is pure evil, but uh, Keith Silverside was really good as him. So, yeah, that's a really fantastic dub. Monster. Monster is probably one of my favorites. Um, the performances were so much fun. The writing and directing were just very spot on. It stayed very true to the original material. Um, and just... The, the production on production wise they knew in general the tone of the show and what they were getting themselves into and how to proceed with it um because monster is a slow burn of a mystery show and um it didn't it did not i don't think waste didn't waste any of that and just i think it was just a phenomenal dub for sure probably still monster because i really like monster monster's a really good show I enjoyed it a lot. It's very much my speed. I think it's very well done. I think the dub is really well done as well. I think it's 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 the correct dub for that show, given what it is. Uh, it kills me that they even broadcast that thing on television. It just did not catch on at the time. You know, now I feel like you know if it, if you know now if it was on like Netflix or Hulu, it would do gangbusters. But like no one gave a shit in the early in the mid two thousands. It sucks. Breaks my heart. Yeah, I'd love to review that someday, but it would have to be available again first. So you know. Uh, but it's a great dub. It's it's it sounds great. It's got all it's got all that lovely tension in the original show. I love it. I I can cheat and say Fruits Basket. I really can because you know, like I think it's genuinely one of the best remakes ever. Um, Aqua Thirteen's also super super fucking up there for me. I think the writing is top notch. I think Christopher Bevan's directing is great. It has one of my favorite ensemble cast. It's also just one of my favorite shows, and I hate that a lot of people like to dunk on it for being slow and boring, but they're all wrong. So. Mm. Um, I, I had to kind of go through my shelf to think, like, what's the thing that really hits the sweet spot as far as, like, both the acting and the writing? And I got to be honest, my favorite dub of an anime is probably for Spice and the Wolf. Uh, that's a medieval set, uh, econ uh, yeah, e economics-based uh, show with a wolf girl that you would not peg for uh, needing to have great direction or writing originally. But I saw it at a very early time in my anime watching time uh, I think it was actually it was streaming on Funimation's YouTube channel at the time that's how I saw it before getting a home video copy of it and the stellar acting by J. Michael Tatum and uh, Brina Palencia mixed with their immaculate writing in that show like that was a level of craftsmanship in good funny conversations between two individuals that were clever like it wasn't just funny jokes it was like clever word choice good banter between the two of them well uh translated into the english language i really think about it. assassination classroom i mean that thing evoked emotions in me ways in ways i didn't understand and the fact that you could take all these elements of a story all these unusual elements combine them and pull them off like that that's uh that's a feat in and of itself, and I think that's springboarded off his career as an ADR director. Double Man Crybaby. Uh, <laughs> my bias is showing, because Ping Pong's also my number two. Uh, they bounce through comedy and drama basically seamlessly, and they have a general feel for, you know, the tone and whatnot, so... And they're generally just well-acted and well-directed. So, yeah, um... 
basically a couple of the Yuasa ones. My all-time favorite dub is probably Full Metal Alchemist um, or Yu Yu Hakusho, but Blood Blockade Battlefront is really up there. Uh, it's just, you know, these dubs just have perfect cohesion. They sound natural. They took liberties, but not too much. It is very much uh, a perfect adaptation where it's not just a literal, literal translation, but it's not people shoving new dialogue in there. It's just, you know, these three shows, fantastic. Vile with a V. I hope I pronounced the first word correctly. Uh, v asks, how will Dub Talk improve in the years to come, and how can Dub Talk appeal to viewers that don't watch dubs? Well, they've hired me on, which is already a step in the wrong direction. Well, obviously, we're just going to get better at discussing things, and we're going to be on even more platforms and get better at editing, and we're eventually going to conquer the world. Uh, or if that's a little too lofty, I think we will continue to get better. Like, I think we have generally gotten better at doing the whole podcast thing and the longer we've been doing this, so I, I see no reason to think we're not going to keep getting better at the more we do it. As far as appealing to people who watch doves, like, I don't know, just because I feel like in this day and age, like, people who refuse, not just, like, don't in general, but, like, refuse to watch doves seem to do it in part because they have a lot of, like, preconceived notions about why doves are just inherently bad, and unless they're willing to, like, you know, in good faith try and hear an argument to change their mindset, I don't know if there's anything you can really say to them that would change their mind. Like, people who are just kind of like, oh, I don't necessarily watch doves, I think, you know, you know, we can talk about, you know, why this is well done, why this is suitable for the show, and they can see for themselves why we think that. Um, but, you know, that that assumes that they are interested in hearing those arguments in the first place, uh, which is not true for everybody who doesn't watch doves. We've always wanted to continue to expand our horizons in terms of what we cover and just the kind of material that we make and... But because we've had a few other things pop up, like you've seen our other side series, like Dead Talk Classics. There's um, Alternative, which is a big one that's in the works. Um, the, the, another newer one that we don't usually utilize as much. Um, and then we also have, at the time that this is recording, and it should be out by this point, um, we just started Dead Talk Retro. Which is the much, much older stuff. Um, and th that was a new show um, that we wanted to start um it was a brainchild of noah clues actually and because we don't really cover the really really old stuff and we probably should like we talk about so many english dubs um for various anime and various other um dubbed media and it's one of those things where it's like <laughs> it's one of those things where it's like why haven't we decided to do the old 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 stuff yet and just improving in our personality, improving ourselves as well, because um, we're human beings and adults and we continue to grow and we learn, expand from um, what we've done in the past few years. Like, we're a completely different podcast than we were like five years ago. Anyone can tell you that. We're learning and we're growing as a group and as individuals as ourselves. So I would say that's how we're hoping to improve is just continuing to grow um, and to expand um, our horizons along the way. This feels like an interview question now. We're getting to know, like, where do you see yourself in five years from now? And I'm, I appreciate the business-minded aspect. Um, I've, and I've thought about that, too. And I know we've had some discussions in the group. Um, everyone else will probably have uh, their own individual answers. But for me personally, I feel like uh, Dub Talk being a very YouTube-centric channel uh, should probably, in addition to doing podcasts, because those are fun to do, also include more scripted video content that gives voice actors their due recognition in a more structured manner while also playing into the YouTube algorithm. I'm not saying that we need to start making those long, hour-long video essays that get hundreds of thousands of views. Uh, that's incredibly time-consuming. But I do think that we could definitely benefit from taking the dub world and turning it into uh, scripted discussions or countdown videos or stuff that's more accessible in bite-sized pieces to the average viewer rather than the hour, two-hour long podcast that we put out. That's got an audience, definitely, and thank you everyone for listening. Uh, I think that we could definitely branch out and take our knowledge and turn it into something uh, a little more substantial as well. Uh, if you look at stuff like the Cartoon Cypher, they're doing a very similar content to what I think that we should also be doing. Their analysis and interviews with voice actors is definitely matched by no one. Uh, go subscribe to the Cartoon Cypher if you haven't already.
I don't know if we ever will appeal to viewers who don't watch dubs, because frankly, we, we sit and give an in-depth look, and there are a lot of fans who are into dubs who won't really give us the time of day because we're too long-winded. I guess to improve, we could try to be shorter, but I'll be real. I can go on for hours on a given subject if given no time restraint, so that's why a lot of my episodes go long. That second question is going to be a toughie, because if most people who don't watch dubs just don't want to or have any interest in getting to learn about them. And so hopefully what we can do is we can see if we can change their, not necessarily change their ways, but make them see what things are like from the other side. And if they like it, that's fine. If they don't, that's cool too. But in the way how we can improve, um, we are definitely looking into other side projects. Uh, we're going to do more Summer of the Movies. We're trying to do more shorter episodes as well. So I can't spoil too much, but just look for it. I think one of the ways that we can really improve is just to keep focus on our on our topics and on our shows at hand. I know a lot of times we tend to go off the rails, which is really funny and really entertaining. But I think if we all kept focus like as a group, I think we could really improve with some things. And I'd, I'd also like to be able to cover more content, which personally is a thing that I believe that we can do and we are doing it's just hard to with coordination for 12 to 13 people and how can dub talk appeal to viewers that don't watch dubs well maybe this would get them to listen and watch dubs just to have some kind of artistic comparison i know a lot of people are very purist and sub only purist and i used to be that way too but once I started doing this podcast and learning about the ins and outs of English dubbing and all the work that gets put behind it, it's really a great creative industry. And from an artistic point of view, it shows a whole different side of the way that anime can be perceived. So, I mean, maybe you'd like to watch them just for comparison's sake after listening to how much we loved or how much we hated something. That could be a way. Well, it's tough. Uh, all the ideas that I've had for ways to improve the end product would just balloon uh, the amount of effort required on any of these. And I think the actual way is making our podcast making more efficient, uh, cutting down on these extra bits. But, you know, the, the way to improve with much of anything is to uh, always do more research and more uh, QA, quality assurance. Like, like everything benefits from those two things, for example. As for the air question, uh, if, for example, you were trying to sell your friend that doesn't watch dubbed anime on this podcast, like a lot of what we're actually doing is just character analysis, which is easy enough to follow even if you don't give a damn about the names attached. Not something I uh, condone, but you can just follow the discussion even if you've only seen the sub. I also just think we're an entertaining group of people and you can enjoy us regardless of the subject matter. Maybe. Question from Nico Robin, but with yaoi hands. I'm so happy I get to read that name. Because that's just Jackson. One episode of the podcast you think everyone needs to go watch. More people need to go watch the defrag episode. Andrew. Andrew, that means you. But let me also give a episode that I'm not on. Uh, the Dragon Maid episode has some really interesting discussion that I think is worth your time. Once again, my personal bias is showing. Um, I just put out an episode for my birthday on Porco Rosso. I think that one was really fun, and I would probably also say my last birthday episode, Get Your Mind Crowds, um, especially given sort of the subject matter and how it relates to today's society, because, you know, social media was starting to get big when Get Your Mind Crowds was actually coming out um but now it is absolutely in your face like consuming kind of future site commentary um uh, sort of in the same vein as sort of lores ventry or starship troopers adaptation definitely worth your time i'm gonna be honest hell if i know we've done over 200 of these things and uh you know I'm not going to say some are better than others per se, but some of them are from when we didn't quite know what we were doing, and some of them are from when we do know what we're doing. So, you know, it varies. Uh, personally, I'd say I like uh, the Gleitner episode turned out really well. I had a lot of fun with that. Uh, and I'm also very proud of the um, Band of the White Serpent episode, because I did a lot of research. 
and I usually don't get to do them. So, you know, check those out. They're, they're a good time. Maquia. Maquia is the episode I am most fucking proud of. Uh, I think I personally, personally with Andrew, knocked it out of the park in terms of media theory and just, like, actually sitting and talking about it. So, yeah, please watch the Maquia episode. The Love Stage episode. Please go go watch the Love Stage episode. And also, if you want bonus points, listen to our interview that we did with David Wald. He sat and talked to us for a really long time, and it honestly was like one of, if not the number one most highlight of my quote unquote anime YouTube podcasting career. So it was such a great time. He's such a wonderful person. Just go, go listen to Love Stage. How many more times do I have to say it? Honestly, I'm most proud of Pop Team Epic. I think it was the most unique episode or one of the most unique episodes we've ever done. And it gives you a good sample of how all of the hosts act. Uh, they're all their opinions, how they're all their individual styles. It's like it's like a, a sampler platter, if you will. It's a dub talk sampler platter. We give you the best of everyone. So, yeah, Pop Team Epic. I was trying to avoid Shem's plug, but I guess... Really the real life episode because that show is a whole lot of fun and you'd be able you'd be surprised what you could discover within yourself if you really think about it. I think everyone needs to watch the Diabolic Lovers episode. That is the episode I started with, and I think that's a good solid start. Uh, well I talked about some of the episodes that I really liked that I'm in. Uh so I should really give a shout out to uh one of the ones that I'm not in. Um, and this goes back to uh, like the early, early days of the podcast. Uh, a lot of people, uh, if you haven't done so already, you guys should definitely go check out the Dakashi Kashi episode that was from like way back in the early days. That was an episode where like no one expected that that show that, you know, the show about a character in a sweet shop and it's about Japanese candy. Like no one thought that that was going to be compelling no one really thought it was going to get a dub. And because of those rock bottom expectations, I think we all, uh, that entire group, really cut loose and had a lot of fun on there. And you can hear it too. Like, I really enjoyed just listening to the guys on that episode. Have fun talking about the fish, talking about the characters, talking about the candy, talking about the coconut cream pies, all of the inappropriate jokes in it. Like, that was, <laughs> again, so that, that was, I think, the episode where I listened to it and I'm like, I think this podcast may have something like it, it could be more than just a bunch of nerdy people who know a lot about English voice actors. It could actually have some chemistry here. I would say Paranoid Agent. I would say Millionaire Detective is a recent one that I really loved doing for sure. Um, Cause it kind of circled back from the Gosick group from like three years ago, which was fun. Um, hmm. Wolf's Rain is a fun one. Was a fun one for me. Um, Nakaimo, even though it was basically four people being tormented by an awful show, that one was a fun one to record and do. Um, so if you wanted to see four people get tormented by a awful, awful harem little sister show, go watch Nakaimo. I guess. Michael Schomer asked to everyone. What is your favorite movie by Mamoru Hosoda and why? I think everybody has a different answer to this question because his movies, while similar, all are very unique to each other as well. Um, other than, you know, obviously, there's always going to be your token furry. There's always going to be whales. There's always going to be the passage of time in some sort of uh, sort of uh, reference. But if I had to pick one, definitely Summer Wars. I think Summer Wars was the best emotional, action-packed, and just just movie-going experience all in one as far as as far as it is. So definitely, Summer Wars would be my personal favorite. Probably the Boy and the Beast. Uh, no, not the Boy and the Beast. Uh, the Girl Who Left Through Time. Girl Who Left Through Time is amazing. Okay, I'll admit I have not actually seen a lot of them. I've seen two, but I think my favorite is still uh, Summer Wars. Wolf Children, because I actually got to see it at MIT with Mamoru Hosoda there to do Q&A. And I have to bring up the story of when I was there and Furries asked Hosoda a question and it completely left him flat-footed. Probably a toss-up between Summer Wars and Wolf Children. Summer Wars is just exciting, and I think it is very much a soda firing on all cylinders. 
Uh, but War of Children, I think, has a lot of really good emotional heft to it. And it led to that time I got to watch somebody ask Mamoru Hosoda if he is a furry. And you cannot beat a memory like that, so... Thank you, Wolf Children. Wolf Children is by far my favorite of any of the ones he's made. I don't think that anyone who knows me is surprised by that, considering that I love my children very much. And watching a movie about the struggles of being a parent is an incredibly like close to home kind of movie to make. And so all the elements of Wolf Children that make it as good as it is are like magnified more when you have children of your own. Or even people who don't have children. I think people who remember their own parents and maybe how much trouble they gave them growing up can look back at uh, something like Wolf Children as a way to remind themselves how great of parents they may have had because of all the hardships they had to go through. I have always been very attached to Wolf Children. Because it's just such a beautiful story, a beautiful, um, beautiful characters, and just I really loved it. And especially because my parent, my parents are divorced, and I mostly was raised by my mother. And um, a single mother for the longest time, yeah, I can feel like I can relate to my mom's struggles through that, raising me and my little sister, because um, we were precocious little troublemakers. So the boy and the beast, because it made me cry the hardest. Because that's the movie that I relate to the most. And I actually, like, my friends down in, my friends that I go visit and play Magic with actively refer to it as that movie that we traumatized Megan with. Now, I want to say Summer Wars, but I know in my heart that the answer is Digimon the movie. Angela Anaconda Short included. I've just watched that movie so many times, uh, and it informs my taste in music to this day. I'm probably due for another rewatch soon. Red the Hawk would like to know, what are your thoughts on English dubs for Japanese video games, and would you ever consider doing an episode for them? Now, that is uh, that is something that's been in the works. Um, I can't give very many details away about that. I'm sure someone else answering in this section will tell you, but uh, yes, covering English dubs for Japanese games has been a uh, talked about idea for quite a while on this podcast, so definitely look forward to that. Unfortunately, I will not be a part of any of those episodes because I don't play video games. And I'm not just saying I don't play Japanese video games. No, no. I don't play any video games at all. My video game collection is restricted to the board games that I have on my shelf, and that's about it. I, I like a lot of video game dubs. I actually will admit that my favorite English performance of the last couple years doesn't come from anime. It's Chris Hackney's performance as Dimitri in Fire Emblem Three Houses. I think it's absolutely sublime. The only problem I see in doing video game dubs is that a lot of them are very, very long JRPGs. Like, I Twitch stream Xenoblade Chronicles 2, and I didn't even do one, and that's another Japanese dubbed video game. I think my first play file, not even doing all of the side quests, was over 200 hours, and it took me alone to do one route of Fire Emblem Three Houses around 40-ish hours. So it's just too much time commitment, but I do like a lot of them. Video game dubs can be a little bit more hit or miss than, you know, a lot of regular anime dubs are, but the good ones are really, really good, you know, like your Personas or uh, the higher budget Final Fantasy ones or, you know, uh, even even recent stuff like 13 Sentinels was really good. So, uh, yeah, I'd hope to be able to talk about it more of those someday. We have done um, dub talk episodes on anime video game adaptations that were turned to anime i.e. the Dagon Romper franchise is one big one um, we did we we did the original we did uh, we did the original animation and we also did despair and future arcs for Dagon Romper 3 um, but in terms of doing like actually talking about english dubs for video games absolutely i would we we it's one of those things where we do want to actually start a spin-off series for specifically English dub video games, specifically to talk about and critique them. Logistically, it's just a little bit tricky because not all of us um, can have access to these video games to talk about, um, to play and talk about later on. So, um, and it also would be several hours so to, to get through them in order to really get your complete thoughts on them. So, logistically, it's a little bit of a struggle um, to get, like, th three or four people to sit down and do it together. Um, but it's definitely something that I know we really, really want to do. Um, but 
for the time being, uh, we're trying to utilize our Twitch channel a lot more too. Um, and we're trying to play more games and highlighting the like uh, highlighting any English dubbed ones specifically. Um, I know Megan has been Megan is um, working through Xenoblade Chronicles two, for example. Um, I know I think Amon and I at some point we want to play the Higarashi visual novels together. I don't think there's dubs attached to them. Um, Dagon Ramba could be in our future as well. Um, like the, we we want to try and utilize it a bit more um, for sure, and maybe eventually we'll figure out a way to start up that um, new side series about video game dubs. I would love English dubs for Japanese video games, especially Otome games or gacha games or like the ones that I play on a regular basis. We almost had one and then they canceled it. So I would love that. And if that happened, I would love to do an episode on them. I'm looking at you, Code Realize. Anything from Access, Collar and Malice is coming out soon. Video game dubs are great. I'm sad when they're only in Japanese. It's usually how I'm getting exposed to the pool of actors in California, but it's also fun seeing actors I'm familiar with from Texas popping up in like Gearbox, which is based in Texas. The dub for I, the Somnium Files is an all-time great, and I need to play more of 13 Sentinels, Aegis Rim. Oh, and this wouldn't be a dub because it uh, originates in uh, English. Uh, Highway Blossoms is a great visual novel in which Jill Harris says a swear. Yeah, bug me on Twitter for opinions at any time. These games are great, and you should talk about them more. I honestly think that, you know, it's very hard. I've talked about this in the past on my show, but when it comes to stuff like uh, uh, Kingdom Hearts, where you have uh, some of the mainline games that have really great uh, dubs, and then you go to RE Chain of Memories that were clearly uh, just using the lip flaps of the Japanese ones, you can see the difference in the dub. You can see how different it works. And it's it's very crucial not only to get good voice actors, but to get people who actually have the time to not just match to the Japanese lip flaps, but completely dub it and redo it and make it sound natural. It is about voice acting, but it's a lot about mixing and editing to make it sound good. Because if you're matching the Japanese lip flaps, you have stilted dialogue where Quentin Flynn, fantastic voice actor, but in Ari Chain of Memories, it just sounds weird for a lot of it. And it's not his fault. So like that, you, you need to have cohesion on the translation on both ends. We have kicked around the idea on doing a, a sub-series where we cover video game dubs. Um, the only reason that uh, that's been slow to get off the ground, mostly just because of finding a game that enough people want to cover that we can do an episode, and just that video games take a lot longer to play through than like your average, you know, one or two core anime series, where like you know you can probably finish one of those in a week. Uh, you can finish a video game in a week, but if you're like me and you tend to be very interested in like side quests and bonus things, it, it can drag on a little bit. Um, one day though, uh, I think I think we have we have some stuff potentially in the pipeline so uh, you might you might uh, you might you might see that episode sooner or later oh god i love them like i think they're fantastic stuff like persona 5 fire emblem danganronpa i the somnium files 13 sentinels like any modern jrpg series that has english dub i think like are genuinely fantastic like i guarantee you a lot of people would love to talk about them but it's it's just a lot of time management and coordinating like Sitting down and watching a show start to finish and talking about it is a lot easier than coordinating people to complete an entire game. Because some of those can get pretty fucking long. Uh, like, people would want to talk about this. I guarantee you there's plenty of people who would. But it's a much bigger time sink compared to a TV anime or movie. From Sosuke Aizen. Which anime protagonist do you dislike or at least not a big fan of? I can't tell you any one particular character, but I can tell you one archetype. That is the asshole character, because for one thing, when I'm watching anime, I okay, I come home from a long day of work, dealing with annoying people sometimes, and the last thing I want to see is another annoying person on TV, you know? Give me the milk toast characters, give me the goody two-shoe characters, I don't want to see any more asshole characters on TV. God, what's the, what's the name of the kid from uh, Future Diary? Him. He is a whiny little shit, and I, I don't care much for him. 
Any early Otome protagonists who have the personality of a wet paper bag, all, all, any and, and all of them. I've come to love, or I've come to love Haruka from Udapri just because it's Udapri, but everybody else, no thank you. I don't really have one specifically, to be honest. Uh, I, I sort of, as a general rule, don't really like the kind of wimpy, milk toast, bland guys who end up being harem protagonists in harem shows. Um, but I also don't watch those because I know I don't enjoy them. Like, the only one I particularly enjoyed is, like, quintessential quintuplets, and that's mostly because the main guy there has a personality. Uh, you know, like, I, I don't care about the guy in Love Hina. He's, he's an obvious audience surrogate, and he's not that interesting. So it's hard to get mad about them because, like, I don't care. I don't watch him. If you asked me a few years ago, I would probably say Kirito from Sword Art. Don't, don't, don't at me. He's not as bad of a main character anymore to me, um, probably because the writer has changed their writing style and how he wants to write the characters, which is for the better, I think. But I'm I, like only just mildly like him a bit more. It's there's still some issues. There's still some issues with, with Sword Art in general. Um, but Kirito, I think, is still... Uh, he's gotten better, but he's... So I had to think about, actually, are there anime protagonists that I really don't like as people themselves? And what came to mind was uh, we had recently watched Golden Time for the podcast not too long ago, and I did not like Coco. I did not like Tata Banri. I, I did not really like any of the other characters in the main cast. You know, they, they had... They ha they're very believable college students and that they're very messed up and had very selfish personality traits. That's just not the kind of people who I want to watch for, like, uh, an entire 24-episode show. Oh, the guy from Big Windup. I hate him. I hate his little fish face he makes whenever he gets flustered and he does it way too often. I just, I just want to punch him in the face. I really don't like Aaron from Attack on Titan. I never really have. I... Spoiler alert, my favorite moment in Attack on Titan is when when uh, Krista punches him in the head. And yes, I do know the manga ending, so I am very firm in my dislike of this character. Uh, gonna probably make a lot of people angry if I had it already when I did that episode, but I'm not really a fan of Asa from Black Clover. I know he gets better later on, but I didn't really like how early on he kind of felt a little Gary Stewish to me, you know, like... Uh, pretty much every time you put him in front of a noble, he was always one-shotting them and, you know, constantly chatting about it, teaming his dreams and kind of, you know, pulling that off without any, like, serious strain in the beginning. And, you know, and everyone around him who wasn't an enemy was kind of always singing his praises and that kind of bothered me a little bit. Uh, he kind of felt like, you know, a knockoff of what I usually like about Shonen protagonists. Again, I mean, I have, you know, read a lot of later stuff in the manga, so I know he does get better, but... Yeah, I'm not really an awesome person. Cerulean 100, would you rather watch a good show with a bad dub or a bad show with a good dub? A uh, bad show with a good dub, depending on how bad the show is. I hate when things I'm excited for have bad dubs and it pisses me off to no end. I do not like being disappointed. So bad show with a good dub. Probably a bad show with a good dub because, I, and I feel like I'm going to be the, major, the majority here in saying that. Because you can just turn off a bad dub. <laughs> I, I think that's kind of the idea. Um, but if if a good dub adds to the entertainment of a of a bad anime, I think that works really well. I'd also be willing to watch a bad dub of a bad anime. I think that would be fun. Oh, this is easy. Bad show with a good dub. Like, if a show's bad, but it has a good dub, that can elevate my opinion of the show overall. Like... You want a perfect example? Uh, Hensky. Hensky is like a 3 or 4 out of 10 show that becomes a 5 or a 6 just with the English dub alone. Like, it makes it a lot more entertaining and enjoyable for me overall. For what would have been a pretty mediocre, like, etchy, like, rom-com anime. I would rather watch a bad show with a good dub because a bad dub is really distracting. A bad dub can really take me out of it. And it's like, I've seen so many good dubs. But if 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 I can turn on subtitles, that's fine. I can deal with, with things, but, you know, just a, a bad dub just takes me out of it. So I, I would actually rather watch a bad show with a good dub. 
you know, King's Game. I watched King's Game. I had fun with that. It was a good dub. Bad show with a good dub by far, because I've watched a bunch of those. And if you can take a really crappy show and give it a really entertaining dub, you can at least salvage it. Um, this is the very reason why I cannot force myself to go through Utena, because the dub is just not good. I've heard wonderful things about the show, but the dub does it absolutely no justice. And the fact that I'm not a big Ikuhara fan in general doesn't help. Uh, definitely would prefer a good show with a bad dub to a bad show with a good dub. I mean, if I don't like the dub, I can always just, you know, turn on the Japanese track. I mean, so unless I would like, you know, just like maybe lukewarm on a show and didn't outright hate it, a good dub really isn't going to improve my opinion of a bad show that much, so, yeah. I think you could make an argument for a good dub elevating a bad show, but if there's just nothing there, what's the point, really? I feel like in practice, I am more likely to watch a good show with a bad dub because it's something I'm interested in already. And bad dubs are much more niche and rare these days that at that point, I feel like I'm learning about a different part of the industry. Like it'll be a much older show or it'll be a different part of the industry that that I'm less familiar with. It'll more often be a dated show or a dub that takes a while to get good then it will be an actual bad dub and a bad experience i would much rather watch the bad show with a good dub and i've definitely done that before uh, i've been it's been much easier to get through uh so-so shows boring shows uh reprehensible shows if the dub itself is good um, I, I think that if you're watching a good show, but the dub itself isn't great, you know, it, it's pulling down the content and nobody wants to have that. But if you're watching a bad show, that's already low level and the dub just like elevates up even two or three points, uh, that'd be preferable. Like, you don't want your good shows ruined, but no one minds if their bad shows are made slightly better. I would rather watch a bad show with a good dub, honestly. Um, cause there, for me, there are a lot of shows that are either mediocre or not too great that have English stubs that make it much more easier for me to watch and much more tolerable. But the, probably the best, which is not listed here, is a bad show with a, with a, with a gag dub. <laughs> Those are always the best. Um, but I would say, to answer your question, a bad show with a good dub. Um, cause it makes it more tolerable for me. Honestly, I'd rather watch a bad show with a good dub because maybe it'll get me to like the show a little bit more. Um, it will give me more appreciation for that show. Um, and bad dubs have been known to turn a show off for me entirely, which is a reason that I will not watch Revolutionary Girl Utena dubbed more than the like 10 minutes that I've watched it because I don't want that dub to ruin one of my favorite shows of all time. And I, I know I it will hurt me on the inside. And I'm kind of of two minds of this because it depends on how bad the dub on the good show is and how bad the show with the good dub is. Because there's a level of bad for show where it doesn't matter how good the dub is like it's not gonna it's not gonna make it any better and there's a level of poor dubbing that even if you have the best show in the universe there is a level of poor dubbing that is going to just make it unwatchable uh like the utina dub is probably a good example where like it, you know it doesn't make utina unwatchable but like it's a real bad dub is that how you want to experience utina no um, and I, I, I feel like for a lot of stuff that, like, good shows that don't have great dubs, it's like, why would you experience this show this way? I just spend the whole time being annoyed that I'm not experiencing this obviously well-made show in a better form. Given that, I, I, I think I'd rather choose a bad show with a good dub, just because I've seen lousy shows that are at least made tolerable or even fun by good dubbing, and I feel like that's going to be a better experience than just being irritated that you're watching a subpar version of something that should be good. I'd rather pick the latter because if you have a good show and your dub kind of sucks, I'm not going to enjoy it as easily. Because, and ask anybody that's ever seen a walk or heard about the walk through. Yeah, they ain't like it either, but you know. And plus, with bad shows, some people kind of go under the radar if the dub is good, you know? I'm going to say the latter because you. Uh, uh... I've said it before and I'll say it again. Um, bad anime is fun. Uh, if it has a great dub to go with sort of crappy production quality or just plot twists that come out of nowhere and absolutely jump the shark, I I love watching those. Um, you have 
seen me go through a couple of them, so yeah. J2 aka Jared on Patreon, as well as Microcuts06 on YouTube, they asked a similar question. Is there an actor that you weren't a fan of when you heard them at first, and what role for them, from them solidified you as a fan? Uh, Austin Tyndall. Austin Tyndall would be my answer to this one, because before the podcast really kind of kicked off and got off the ground, the only show that my, my, my first introduction to Austin Tyndall as a voice actor was Guilty Crown. And Guilty Crown is not great, and he was not that great. Um, but, oh my god, like... 2015 was the year of Austin Tindall because you had freaking Karma from Assassination Classroom and Kaneki from Tokyo Ghoul. Um, in terms of some of a role that solidified it, probably, I believe this came out the next year. Um, after that, it would be Obi from Snow White with the Red Hair. Um, Obi is a wonderful character, so much fun, a little bit of a troll, so Austin got to have, like, Austin got to, um, utilize some of his karma troll-esque ways um just dial down a bit just dialing it back a bit because <laughs> karma is just like very out there punched up for more comedic effect um but i would say solidified for me would be obi uh for snow white with the red hair oh boy speaking of uh not liking your college self uh when i was just getting into anime back in college and i was I had watched, you know, about a dozen or so shows at that point. I had this very negative opinion of one Brittany Karbowski. And I, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Yes, put, put, hold off on the pitchforks. I'm, I will say nice stuff. Uh, now, at the time of, uh, you know, getting into anime, uh, I had seen Brittany and stuff like uh, Black Star in Soul Eater or the goddamn Maho in Pony Pony Dash. But because of that, I I'd had this uh, unfavorable opinion of her... Uh, uh, obnoxious voice because those were all characters who were supposed to be obnoxious like they weren't supposed to be heroic they were supposed to be slightly annoying and luckily and i have to apologize to Brittany for having that opinion because uh, i think it was around 2017 2018 after the one-two punch of gamers where she played karen tendo and review starlight where she played karen, uh, another karen karen ijo uh, plus like a dozen bit rolls in between there that I, I took a complete 180 on Britney's uh, entire performance. Like she still got the um, the the anime voice that is her defining characteristic, but she's got a lot of acting range and a lot of vocal range as well. Like I, she really surprised me uh, this year watching Gleepnir. Like I couldn't I did not believe that that was her originally. Madeline Morris, because the first time I heard it was I said it and uh, not a lot of us were kind of sold on that dub, let alone the show to be honest. But then, how not to summon a demon lord came around and when I heard it as Krebs called me, it was like, Jesus Christ, man, I don't know, it just like something came over me and all of a sudden I started to admire her after that, to the point she follows me on Twitter now. I've been pretty vocal about how Bren April had to grow on me because Izumiko from Red Dater Girl was not her best performance but uh, she quit very very quickly um, got much much better and later in her career and now she is one of my favorite voice actresses in Funny's Pool right at the moment um, I think a highlight from her was definitely interviews with Monster Girls was one of my favorites as as uh, as I believe it's Hikari, because I don't think it's I don't think Bryn plays Hikari. I think she is Hikari in a lot of ways. Like I was a little on the fence with Dallas Reed when I first heard him and stuff, but I think it was Token Ron Hanamaru where I really started to actually appreciate it. And then, um, <laughs> boy howdy, Black Clover. Uh, but really, don't get me wrong, I, I really liked him in in. Black Clover, it, but it's particularly Angels of Death, where I really sort of took a shining to how he he handled Zack, and I think that was really the the tipping point where I'm just like, okay, I am with this guy. Uh, let's see, I wasn't too big on Christine Marie Cabados early on, but she really won me over as Meadery and Toradora. Uh, she sounded really fun and peppy, and she also had some really great dramatic chops for a lot of uh, that character's bigger moments. And I just liked a lot of Christine's works, a lot of Christine's work ever since. I mean, it kind of helped that she went on to play Mako like 
around the same time, so uh, she was a lot of fun in Kill a Kill too. But yeah, uh, definitely like her scenes work a lot more now. I mentioned it before. I I really 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 like Garrett Storms. I couldn't stand him before Token Rob Hanamaru was Cashew as not as Cashew as Cashew. Um, and then the other one uh, that I think we go over it on the episode a lot is um, Gabriel Rogojo. I didn't like him very much because I think he's in one of the worst dubs I've ever seen as the lead. And then he was Ryohei and Surine, and he knocked it out of the park. So I've been a fan of him ever since. I think one of the worst first impressions and most improved uh, for me has been Rachel Messer. First time I heard her was in Akasic Records, which was just a terrible show that I only really checked out to hear Josh Greeley play a asshole lead character. Uh, but I noped out of that after the first episode. Uh, and Rachel's character was just a really poorly written tsundere, and the acting was not helping in that regard. And then fast forward to this year, where I heard her in some really great performances. Performances that have made me cry. So yep, yeah, uh, I'd say that was the... I wouldn't use the word fan, but I would use the word most improved. Hydrangea asks, questions for everyone. What are your favorite dubbed songs in anime? In Dance with Devils, there's a song from Mage. Mage is the Great, done by Rap Enrico Fajardo. That's probably my favorite dubbed anime song of all time. Other than the great classics from the Deke dub of Sailor Moon, like Rainy Day Man and The Power of Love and uh, uh, the nostalgia trip right there. I really like the song Stones from the Rolling Girls, and I believe it's episode eight or nine um, that Brina Palencia sings. I asked her about it at a convention once, and she only got to dub that one little section that they had for the TV, but she said she would love to go back and actually record the whole song if she had the chance. I also think the songs from Zombieland Saga were some of the better dub songs out there. Well, it's simple. The best dub songs in anime are the openings, English openings and endings for you, Hakusho. That's not an opinion. That's a fact. Uh, and if you don't believe me, you should go to YouTube and listen to Smile Bomb right now. And if you think I'm wrong, well, I don't believe you. I think you're I think you're making things up to try and prove a point. So there. I'll be real. I don't really like a lot of dubbed anime songs, which is a surprise. I'll probably say one of the... I forget who does it in actors, but I think the, cl- the school president in actors, his dub song is probably my favorite anime dub song. Otherwise... I don't really like them a lot, which is strange because I run a I help run a podcast called Dub Talk. Oh, why did I spend any time thinking about this? The answer is Moon on the Water from Beck. Uh, Greg Ayers and Brian Plancy are both fantastic singers, and I have not stopped thinking about that song since college. Probably Caitlin Glass's song at the end of episode eight in Cash and Sins. I just really like that whole sequence in general, and I really like the original version of that song, so I'm glad Caitlyn's performance really had about the same level of energy, and it's just, it's just a really beautiful scene. You cannot do better than Beck Mongolian Chop Squad. Because the characters are speaking in English in the dub, you have to have them singing in English too. You can't have the, you know, the love life, or I'm not the, um, the love Hina thing where the characters, uh, just switch to a different language when they start singing. No, in Beck, it has to be fully immersive. And the singing is that is not only great, but the writing, like the adaptive lyrics are great. I love the soundtrack. I love the English soundtrack of uh, Brainstorm, Moon on the Water, Slip Out, I Got a Feeling. Like that entire soundtrack is great. Go on YouTube, if you haven't already done this, and look up uh, Beck Mongolian Chop Squad OST English, and you'll find someone did a 30 minute cut where they actually took all of the dub singing that they could find and uh, mixed it all together to be a fully comprehensive soundtrack. That is amazing singing. I'm going to say that my favorite dub songs in anime only from a more on like a technical and logistical level is going to be the songs done from actors songs connection um not only were they well produced um well mixed and everything they did it on a simul um, on a simul dub schedule because this was before the pandemic hit and everything and they had to like do episodes every single week basically so to do it in that time frame like is downright amazing so i'm gonna say actor songs connection for sure julia w asks uh as a group what are each of your personal favorite number one anime of all time can be old or new 
Now, my classy answer, as I said, is Monster, because Cult Monster is very dignified, it's very well-respected, it's really easy to say you like Monster, because it's, uh, it's, you know, you, you can sound cool doing it. But if I'm gonna, but, and that's accurate, I love Monster, that's great. But if I'm gonna give a more personal answer, it might be something that's probably gonna be Fooly Cooly, because that has people getting hit in the face with a blue Rickenbacker 4001 bass guitar, and that just makes me happy. Maybe it's not quite as, uh, obviously deep or philosophical as monster or something if it's deep and philosophical in its own way but you know i can't say no to musical instrument based violence it's who i am i feel it in my soul i have said this a few times believe it or not it's not paranoia agent it's actually naoki urasawa's monster it is a very it's of course my brand of bullshit so dark psychological mystery um just so fantastic and it has a great dub to it too uh, it was my, I think it's one of my, has my favorite performances from both um, Liam O'Brien and Keith Silverstein ever, as well as Patrick Seitz, actually, as um, Wolfgang Grimmer. And it's just so, so good, and I loved it so much. Uh, it's it's the white, it's my current white whale that I want to have rescued so much. Um, Paranoid Agent is another, well, it was another white whale, but I got rescued last year, so thank God. But someone please rescue Monster. Um, I would greatly appreciate because I would talk about this show all day if I had the chance. I'm actually going to say House of Five Leaves. Um, it is one of those really slow burn period dramas. It, it's it's just great. And unfortunately, it's no longer available to stream, but I really like it. Uh, well, my number one anime of all time tends to lean towards Code Geass. Uh, I like Berserk a lot, too. Uh, I'm trying to think if there's anything else. Um, I'd say that was probably where I, it would lie. Um, I can't really think of anything else. Uh, my favorite anime ever is, is Fruits Basket, both versions. Uh, I've made this clear very many times that that is, like, my favorite anime. I also think it's, like, the best remake anime ever done at this point, and Full Metal Alchemist, uh, Brotherhood fans can fight me in the comments. Uh, favorite anime is definitely Penguin Drum. I really did Kiyuni Hiko Ikuhara's love of, like, crazy storyboarding and using them to pack in a bunch of really weird and, like, and kind of poignant visual metaphors. I also just really like the way that show kind of, you know, talks about, uh, kind of the way children can be discarded by society and family and how uh, people don't have to necessarily be decided by, like, who their family is and they can choose who they are for themselves. Uh, it's, uh, really... It's just a really great show. I kind of ashamed the dub doesn't really hold up. Nana. Nana is the best. I'm so excited it got licensed rescued. We're ready for it, fam. I guess in reality, my favorite anime of all time is We Life because it actually changed me for the better. Made me who I am, what I am today. I don't try to put a name down for a favorite, but I will give one for this answer here. I can say that the series Kino's Journey uh that uh i watched as like one of the first anime that i ever watched and it was the very first anime that i saw in a streaming group i remember that this was uh back when i was also a part of a small online community that had uh regular streaming nights where people would rip their dvds and broadcast uh, what they had in their collection for a small group you know it was, this was this was not breaking very many laws but the Kino's Journey stream was, like, really formative as, like, not only was I enjoying something that I'd never seen before, but it was also with a group of equally minded people that you could chat with in real time from all over the world. There were no boundaries based on location. And not only that, but the show itself was really good. It was a kind of show that I highly recommend you go watch. Go pull up High Dive and watch the original Kino's Journey if you haven't already. It is a very deep contemplative atmospheric kind of show that we don't see a whole lot of similar kind of shows being made nowadays all right for this one i'm gonna say two my hero academia and a silent voice uh my hero academia is kind of a safe one but honestly it's it's like a combination of all of the things that i fell in love with anime to begin with just done really really well and still going strong and endearing me to this day and a silent voice is a gorgeous beautiful moving emotional gripping story i love the manga and the anime genuinely feels like a true 
like distill version of that in the best ways. Now, this is going to be a hyperbolic answer, but my hope is that you will take this as a very strong recommendation because my answer is Chihaya Furu. Now, I understand this is a hard sell because it's a very Japanese concept. You have this memory game based on traditional Japanese poetry. But when I say it's one of the best things that Madhouse has ever done, I'm being 100% sincere. Well, I mean, like I said earlier to Alice, uh, it's Cowboy Bebop. That's, uh, I know that's a cliche answer, but it obviously is the show that got me hooked, and uh, it has stayed with me ever since. Samuraiko, what is the most catastrophic tech failure you ever had with the podcast? For a lot of the early ones, I had a really nice uh, blue snowball mic. I did not set audacity to use that mic. Uh, instead, I ended up recording my voice through the laptop microphone. Um, that is why Parasite, Heavy Object, I think all the way up to Grimgar, I just sound like absolute shit. It is because I was using the wrong microphone. I, I learned my lessons after that to make sure everything was sort of set to the right settings, but yeah. Fortunately, I haven't run into anything too severe yet. I think the worst of it was uh, one time where a portion of a person's audio had been lost, like a track skipping over type of deal. I was able to kind of cut around it and weave it in with other people's audio, but that was just kind of a pain in the ass to do. I won't tell you when and where this happened, but see if you can guess. I will not say which episodes, so you can find out through the magic of trying to discover it for yourself. But there have been some episodes where we have completely lost one of the per one of one person's recording, and uh, that was pretty devastating. There were tears and cursing, and we had to go back and do it with the magic of editing and re-record all of that person's thoughts on the dub and it's not it's happened a few times so that that hurts for everyone involved because we just spend three to four hours recording an episode and then a quarter of it is lost and that's uh it hurts me well as you know from the prison school episode we have had one where an entire episode had to get scrapped because of um audacity fuckery uh and i almost had that happen to me too actually while i was recording the boogie pop episode right as i was saving my audio my copy of audacity crashed now, thankfully, as it turns out, Audacity, like, temp save stuff in another folder, so, I'll, and it was all still there, so I was able to, like, import everything, like, I don't think I lost any of my audio, uh, but I was very, very afraid for a hot second that the three hours we just spent recording this were going to be for naught, and I was, we were either going to have to do it again, or I was going to have to try and reconstruct my audio based on very little information. Prison School. The first time we tried to review Prison School, it's just... It was, without going into uh, too much perspective um, or trying to plate fingers, it was just an absolute, absolute nightmare. And it uh, it's the reason why we chose it to come back to it for our 200th ep episode, because it was one of the lost episodes. So it's good to have finally have that one done and out in the world. Well, uh, it took us a few years to finally get that prison school episode out, so I'd say that was probably one of our uh, bigger technical errors, but... Uh... Had a pretty fun time recording it both times around, so can't really complain too much. It was a lot of fun to watch that show. I'm definitely going to take the blame on this one, and it's for a good reason, too. Um, long at the beginning of our podcast, uh, in like the first 15 episodes, we had uh, recorded an episode on prison school, back when that was new, back when it was originally airing. Uh, it was a group of five of us had recorded the episode, had a really great time with it, too. Like That was one of the first times where a lot of us interacted with each other, and then I had realized, guys, my microphone was not recording for most of that episode and I, I thought to myself I'm an overachiever I can just go back in and re-record my segments for this to fill in the gaps couldn't I could not do that 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 was so much of an undertaking that I could and you could not recreate that spontaneity even if I had I had everyone else's audio to work off of and I could like try to piece together what, what did I say or what what was the joke that I said back there it was just too much I could not refill in the audio for that one and that was a huge failing of mine i have to this day never forgotten to check to make sure the microphone is actually recording wait hold on a second let me check right now 
Yep, still recording. The first episode that I ever did with Lack, I didn't tell him how to record his audio. And we did the entire thing and Lack's audio never recorded. And then when we redid it, I wasn't happy with my own personal commentary. So yeah. Oh boy, the amount of tech failures that people have had. Oh god. We've had chunks of audio missing. We've had computer updates and smack that and recordings happen um for me though my probably my biggest tech failure um happened for a few recordings last year where i didn't have enough space on my external hard drive and then my hard drive just decided in some of my recordings it happened it happened with me particularly with oh my is in your seventh season and um show bits where parts of my audio got cut out for like three or four minutes at a time and i had to go back and re-record those sections to the best of my freaking ability and i pissed me off so much um that's my biggest tech failure for sure uh when i first started doing a facial editing i barely had any understanding about how edited software works and when i rendered the first few episodes matter of fact first visual episode i did was a uh, serve amp Ooh, the difficulties I had with that episode, boy, I couldn't get things to line up correctly. Rendering was all over the place. At some point, I had rendered a file that came out to 170 gigabytes. Don't ask me how. From Sharebear and also Seru 100. What anime do you want to do an episode of Dub Talk on the most? Definitely First Basket and Kuroko's, but I'm not doing either of them until they're done which both of them top out around the 70 episode count. So yeah, expect a long episode for those. Personally, right now, um, if Di uh, Dynanazon gets a dub, I really want to be on Dynanazon because I didn't get to be on Gridman's episode and I'm a little bitchy about that still. I'm a little salty about that. I would like to do an episode, if I could do an episode on a place other than the universe, assuming it ever gets a dub, I really want to do that. Uh, and eventually I'm going to have to do Black Rock Shooter. We need to get some Canadian representation on this show. Just anything out of Ocean. I think Gintama especially would be interesting to cover. I really, really want to get a Kaguya-sama Love is War dub talk off the ground. Now that we know and have a full season one dub available, this makes this a whole lot easier. I just need to sit down and actually coordinate the logistics, but this is one I really want to do. To be honest, I really want to do either a Space Dandy episode or a Railgun episode. Space Dandy because it's loads of fun. We can play around with it like we, we'd want to. Uh, Railgun episode because that is the only franchise in the Cell Cel Rail Deck series that actually kind of makes sense to me right now. <laughs> to explain that franchise would be very difficult, but Railgun seems simplest of the most. I know you're listening to this, Mario. <laughs> don't, don't try to disagree with me. Uh, definitely Monster. Just, uh, gotta hope someone rescues that someday. Monster. Monster. 100% Monster. It is my favorite series of all time. Um, if you asked me a couple of years ago, I would have said Paranoid Agent, but we finally, but we did. So that's awesome. Monster. Uh, I have a list of things that I'd like to cover at some point. Uh, the big, big one is Monster, which, uh... You know, I think a number of us on the podcast would love to do, but it's just not available. I think even to the point where that um, Siren Visual release used to be able to get, I think, is no longer available. I think Siren Visual may have gone defunct or something. It's unclear to me what happened there. Um, so until it gets li licensed again, like, that one's just on the back burner forever. Uh, as far as, like, more recent stuff, I'd really like to do an episode on Other Side Picnic, uh, which requires Other Side Picnic to have a dub. So hopefully it will get a dub. Looking at you, Funimation, don't disappoint me, please. I don't think you're going to, but please don't. Skate the infinity. No comment. <laughs> well, to be perfectly honest, I'd really like to do one for Bacchano, but it's not going to happen because Antiplex sucks and they won't make it available for streaming anymore. But um, other than that, what I'd really like to do is go back into one of those these old shows from the late 90s, early 2000s, and just cover something that's technically out of print but still available for streaming. Uh, I think some of those shows are like... Uh, the first season of You're Under Arrest is one of my favorites. Um, I recently found out that Hikaru no Go has a complete dub and has been done for like 10 years. Is that crazy? And uh, and there's the Virtue of the first 24 episodes of the Virtue of Fighter animated series are all up on Amazon Prime. And that dub is 
It's not good, but it is a joy. I'm going to have to go with Whisper of the Heart. Is this um, uh, probably uh, one of the lesser known, but definitely one of the higher quality Studio Ghibli films uh, made in 1995. And the reason I want to cover that is not just because I really like the story, the story of this uh, young middle school girl who is basically an aspiring writer and gives herself a bit of a challenge, uh, but it's also peppered with Disney voice actors uh, that kind of flavors the the overall dub to, in uh, in general. It really gives it uh, of its era flavor that I think would be really interesting to talk about. Sunlit Lake asks, what series do you want to see that get the Fruits Basket treatment? I.e. a great series that only got one series detoured from the manga too much, but had an awesome dub cast who reserved to tell the story to its fullest. I think the show that's going to get this answer the most is for right now is the promised neverland because the anime adaptation straight so far from the source and just dropped the ball on so many levels that i i think even as someone who is an anime only watcher and hasn't actually watched the second season i have to say it's the promised neverland i think soul eater is going to get a lot too but i actually kind of like the ending to that because a few of the characters who die in the manga survive in the anime. Uh, I'll tell you exactly which one needs to get more seasons, and that's Bakano. Yeah, the guy who wrote Bakano wrote way more content than just the 16 episodes that we got. And it's a real shame that, uh, for whatever reason, the uh, uh, Brains base didn't feel the need to adapt it any further. I, I have to theorize that maybe a show that is set in 1920s America... No, I'm sorry late 20s early 30s america did not resonate so much with japanese uh viewers and it's kind of evidenced by that the fact that the sister series to bakano durarara which is very similar content wise except it's set in modern day japan that was so popular that it got four full seasons produced and Almost all the content from you know that was available to be adapted got animated. Not so much with Bakano. I uh, I honestly like as much as I keep hearing that this went off the rails in the manga. I want Soul Eater to get a fruits basket treatment. Soul Eater was amazing, and not enough people talk about it now. And it had a really great dub cast. So just just redo it with the same dub cast. It'd be great, but just continue on. I love it. The one that's coming to mind is Soul Eater. Not that it was the worst thing, or that I never finished the manga to compare it to, but it was a very weird deviation. Like, it does still hold up in a lot of ways. Laura Bailey and Lucy Christian have always been fantastic, but I think, like, some of the writing could be improved, uh, and some actors could do a better job with those same characters today. Actually, I kind of read this wrong. <laughs> But um, what series do I want to get the Fruits Basket treatment as in, please reboot it, give it a whole new anime with a new dub, because the first dub was not that great, is Magic Knight Ray Earth. I would love to have a new Magic Knight Ray Earth series. It's one of my favorite of all time. And I know a lot of people don't watch the old one, but if, if it could just get a reboot, I would be so happy, but not with the old dub cast. Let's not go there. <laughs> The closest I'd say is it might be interesting to see like a more manga accurate version of Trigun, uh, which isn't which you know, I haven't actually read the man much of the manga of Trigun, so that's not really like oh I think the manga like you know is better per se. Like I think the Trigun anime is really good, but it just sort of be interesting to see that because I know the anime goes in its own direction pretty early on. It'd be interesting to kind of compare and contrast those two. Some people will probably say uh, Tokyo Ghoul um silly eater even though my understanding the manga derailed a bit well hold on actually the first basket treatment i'm gonna say yona of the dawn um because yona of the dawn only has one core and it just kind of abruptly ends even though there was a hell of a lot more of the story to it and i have also been reading that manga and oh my god I am very sad that Perot just dropped the ball and they didn't keep going with it. So I'm going to say Yon of the Dawn, actually. Uh, my default re answer for an anime reboot used to be Shaman King, but uh, we have that now. So I don't know. I guess maybe The Promised Neverland a uh, decade from now. I mean, the wound is kind of a little too fresh with that anime adaption. So I don't know, but I guess that. Mr. Michael Schomer wants to know what is the worst anime you have ever seen and why? 
uh, I did this. I went down my um, Annie list chart of everything that I've ranked, you know, everything I've seen and what numbers I gave to it. And I went down near the bottom and I'm like, what did I give the lowest score to? And although there are shows that I ranked lower than this, this is probably the most disappointing show I've ever seen. And that was the 2017 Kino's Journey anime by Studio Lurch. It, it was, oh my God. So I talked about how much earlier I loved the original Kino's Journey and I really had high expectations for the remake especially because lurch is a studio that at the, that point i thought could do no wrong you know they did school live they did assassination classroom and obviously just being the studio doesn't uh mean that the every one of their productions is going to be great but i had reasons to hope for greatness and i was so let down kino's journey 2017 is just the worst accumulation of not catching the original spirit of what made the original Kino's Journey so great. I don't know if it was closer to the books and therefore the books just weren't as good as the anime was, or if the uh, anime just wanted to make what they thought would be the most people-pleasing material, and so they picked stuff like Jeep Catching on Fire, or The Ship Country, or the radio country. I can easily go into my um, my Annie list and tell you what I thought the worst shows were. Um, I can scroll down in a second. Hold, hold, please. <laughs> Looks like school days, because it's school days. Uh, Poopa. Oh, friggin' hell. Poopa is an awful show. So awful. I hated it, and I felt so uncomfortable, and you would think it's normally my shit. The original Helsing TV show is among one of my least liked ones. Oh boy, yeah, 100%. Um, just the, the the original TV show is just, oh my god. It started out okay, it started out good, and then it just devolved. I think mostly because the manga was not finished at the time. Uh, Brothers Conflict is another one. As much as I enjoyed recording Brothers Conflict, the show itself I was not the biggest fan of. Puni Puni Poemi. Uh, what the hell did I watch? I don't. What? Yeah, that's a hard one. I try to avoid bad anime as much as I possibly can. Um, all I'm thinking is Goku Midnight Eye, and even that wasn't that bad, but it wasn't good either. It was really not good at all. Oh boy, let me think back. Because, man, I've seen some clunkers. Um, Chaos Dragon. You know what? It's Chaos Dragon. I don't know how that show failed so hard. It had a bunch of really creative people doing basically D&D. &D, but it, it just fell flat on its face. I don't hate it, but I'm really disappointed by it. So, yeah, Chaos Dragon. Yeah, the worst anime I've ever seen was pretty much the reflection, uh, simply because, like I said, even with the animation, it, it that was still kind of terrible. I mean, there were some people giving it their all, but the direction was just piss poor. Like. I mean, there's a lot of bad ones, or like ones that were kind of like, bleh. So, I mean, sometimes bad ones are fun. I'm going to say Bleach, because it's, it's a lot of disappointment, and the more I think back on it, the more I think... Eh, it kind of sucks. I've also got equally complicated feelings about uh, the Charlotte anime. Boy, do I have a lot of complicated feelings. Worst anime I've ever seen in my life. I mean, Nakaimo's pretty fucking up there. I'm probably going to say Nakaimo just because it, it's pretty rank. And it, I think you can tell if you've watched the, the Nakaimo episode, nobody was happy to do that. Like, I don't, I think I, I think I got like a note back from Amon that said, I have never, Amon or Jet, I think it was Jet who edited it, who edited the audio. And I just get a note back that says, you all sound miserable. <laughs> and I'm like, yup, that was that show I hated myself after. Uh, I mean, I've seen occasional stinkers here and there. The worst is probably Show Me Sample, which is just, I already don't like harem shows all that much. I think a lot of them are just kind of stupid. And it's also just got a lot of weird class stuff in it that, like, makes you kind of uncomfortable. It's just, it's, it's not fun, like, uh, you know, like, I also saw Divine Gate pretty early in my career on this show, which is also not very good, but that's just kind of bland. Like, it doesn't, it doesn't kind of irk me the way Show Me Sample does. <sighs> I, it's not the worst I've ever watched, because I've watched some absolute crap. 
but the one that offends me to my very core is this OVA from ADV uh, that ADV put out t like 20 years ago called Ninja Resurrection. It actively offends me, and I absolutely despise it. Girls, bravo. I don't really have to say why, do I? Great. <laughs> Y'all should know. I tend to enjoy watching other people suffer more than taking on that suffering myself, so I don't really have a... Wait, no, yes I do. The answer is want to be the strongest in the world. This is back from a couple of years ago when I was watching more seasonal stuff, and this one was just interesting enough for me to watch six episodes. So basically, it's Idol gets wrapped up in the world of wrestling, basically on a dare. And I actually do kind of like stories where the protagonist sucks at the thing that they want to do for a while. And this girl sucks. Uh, but what this actually involved was this girl spending a lot of time in a single submission hold and porn moaning the entire time. Which is just not something I could suffer any longer. Thank you for the question. How dare you make me remember that show. At Bunny Cartoon, aka Don from the Anime Nostalgic Podcast. Hi Don, it was fun having you on the City Hunter episode. Uh, asks, uh, if you could produce a dub for a series that never got one, which series would it be and who would you cast as your lead? And I do have an answer to this. In my dream of dreams, if I could give anything a dub, it would be Tatami Galaxy, which is probably my favorite show that hasn't gotten a dub, because dubbing that would be hard, just on the bare minimum of how absolutely rapid-fire some of the dialogue is. Um, but, you know, they gave uh, The Night of Short Walk On Girl a dub, and that's not quite as rapid-fire as Tatami Galaxy gets, but, like, if they can do that, like, Tatami Galaxy might have a shot one day. I don't know who I cast as the lead just because he talks so fast. Uh, and I feel like, you know, unless you're going for computer assistance on some level, you're just kind of limited to, like, what can the human body physically do? Um, but assuming they can do it, I would like to see Jerry Jewell play him because I think Jerry Jewell could really get the emotional core of that character really, really well. Even if I don't think that kind of... And, like, Jerry, Jerry's a more talented guy than I think sometimes people uh, acknowledge because I feel like sometimes it's like, oh, he's just the guy in Kodocha or he's just... Uh, Victor and Yuri on ice. It's like, no, he's, he's got a lot of range. I could I could buy him being able to nail that performance if maybe have to be a little computer assisted to actually speak that fast. Thunderbolt Fantasy. Like, most definitely, it, it would be Thunderbolt Fantasy. Um, let's see. Fan casting. Um, most definitely, Lin Satua would be uh, Damon Mills. And I would probably say uh, Shofukan would probably be... Uh, 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 lower voice register. Uh, I'd probably say Jonas Scott or Chris Waycamp. There we go. I think I answered this earlier, but Space Adventure Cobra. And uh, I would if, if it was a if it was a, a Sentai directed dub, either Andrew Love or Rob Mongol as Cobra. But let's be honest here: if I was calling his shots, I would definitely give it to my band Lack the Watcher. <laughs> Love you, Liam. Uh, pretty sure literally no one but me would ever ask for this, but uh, give me a cross game dub, Sour Glucian Dodge, and Erica Mendez is going out. Uh, the cross game is such a chill and kind of sad romance show, and I'd really kill for more people to see it, so yeah, just give me cross game. I actually have been getting a fair number of my white whales crossed off the list in the past couple of years, uh, but one I'm still hounding Nozomi for is Sound of the Sky. I've bought that show twice. Kleckner, I know you've read my comments. I will buy that show a third time. If you start a Kickstarter for that dub, I will throw in as much money as I can and boost it as much as possible. As far as casting the lead, this isn't my forte. I'm much more comfortable just making shit posts about casting, in which case my answer would be uh, Erica Mendez for very shit posty reasons. But the actual name coming to mind right now is Lindsay Seidel. I think uh, she would be great as Kanata Sarumi. Oh, frick balls. Um, oh, this is hard. Oh, no, I've never thought about this. Oh, crap. Um, so I have want I own this and I haven't watched it yet, but I have always been interested in uh, Galilei Donna, which is a show that Discotech picked up and they never they never dubbed it. And it was going out of print, so I grabbed it. If I could do that, the youngest one can be Jill Harris. Uh, the oldest one 
can be Amber Con Amberly Connors. <laughs> and the middle one can be in the middle one can be Marissa Lenti. <laughs> Sound Cadence Por Favor. Um <laughs> Also, please put that please put that answer to dubs dubs for shows that never got dubbed that Megan wants dubbed for. <laughs> Galilee Donna. It's it's Uda it's Uda Pri, guys. And if, if David Wald doesn't play Kamu, I don't I don't know what I'm gonna do with my life. I just it has to it has to happen. That's in my head. He can also write and direct it. I don't care. All four seasons, any of the seasons. Just just please. Please, my rainbow overlord. If it ever comes across your desk, please, please take it. And please play Kamu. I will accept no one else. <laughs> so I said originally that sweetness and lightning is something that I would love to see have a dub. And let me tell you right now, if the gods had let me had my way, I would cast sweetness and lightning to have an actual grade schooler to play Sumugi in that show. Because I think that would just make it so much more special to have an actual child voice playing the character, if they could, who would play the dad, Kohei. I gotta be honest, uh, I immediately thought of Chris Waycamp when thinking of this question. And then you gotta ask, uh, so who would play Katori, the high school girl who helps the two of them learn how to cook, essentially? And she's got a bit of a, a slightly uh, misanthropic personality trait to her, while still being really optimistic at the same time. So the name that jumps to mind is actually Leah Clark. Simple gift. I don't know who would I cast as a lead. I haven't really thought that so far ahead, but I always thought Melly Grant should be Cagliostro, just simply just because show the Aoi is that character in Japanese, and if you know about show show to Aoi, the vibes that person can give off, I get the same vibes from Melly Grant. Um, Banana Fish, and I would cast myself as Ash Lynx. All right. Moving right along, before I sabotage any chance I have of actually being in the dubbing industry. Aizen Sosuke wants to know our opinions on the Netflix jail situation. Thinking about it, I largely don't have a problem with the uh, Netflix binge model, for example. Uh, if that's how they want to release a show, that's their purview. And I find that the Netflix dubs are often worth the wait. Uh, what I do have a problem with is the... Is holding back the show in one region while in its country of origin they're getting new episodes every week. If everyone was getting this show at the same time I would have zero problem with the way Netflix does things. They did it once with Vile Evergarden which I understand is a exception but it needs to be more common. Um, I won't watch a show until it's out of Netflix jail and until it's on Netflix and I can legally watch it dubbed. Uh, I'm always behind on everything, so I don't mind waiting. Now, if this is for home video release, that really pisses me off because I'm a collector and I like to have anime on a nice box on my shelf and Netflix prevents me from that. So mm -mm, no buenos for that. They need to get their head up out of their ass, man, because that whole benching model, I do not like it simply because, you know, it kind of reduces the discussion people have about certain animes as well as they don't simulcast in the US. They do apparently simulcast outside Japan, but that seems to be a regional thing and I don't know what the hell's going on. Also, they tend to miss certain things in credits sometimes, depending on the studio. It kind of sucks, but I also kind of get it. I don't like having to wait, but at the same time, I've got a lot of other shows on my plate and... You know, if I have to put one off for three to six months, that's not the end of the world. I, I know a lot of other people are sort of are absolutely up in arms whenever Netflix picks up a show, um, especially some of the ones that they picked up this month. Them getting Eden Zero kind of sucks, but I have enough to to watch for this show. Um, and I try to watch some stuff for my own personal viewing, but... Mainly I watch anime for, for dub talk now, but I have enough on my plate that it doesn't bug me nearly as much. Um, it sucks. Really, it does. Um, but I think if if you're a fan of Arcade and Glass Reflection, he actually recently did a video on the subject. And I think he did a phenomenal job with it, where part of the issue with the Netflix jail situation is the is their business model and how they make things bingeable 
um, upon release in like in all con- in all the other territories, obviously outside of Japan because they have their original sh- original exclusive stuff, and it sucks. It really does. It works for their business model though, and like it, the numbers are there. Um, and Arcado goes is re- really did a good job of going through kind of explaining some of it. He took B stars for example, and how the popularity of that show just was it, it, it was. It was spiking and peaking when it was airing in Japan, but then once it became available in English everywhere else, um, it, it, the popularity just like skyrocketed um, so much. And it makes sense for their business model. Um, it sucks, but it, it really sucks because I would love to, I would really love to watch the second season of Beastars right the hell now. Um, but. I'm also a patient human being, and besides, I have way too many shows currently to watch as is. <laughs> I'm gonna say something a little controversial. I think it's a little overblown. Like, I, I I have a lot of concerns about how Netflix treats home video releases of their work, because they, by and large, don't do a lot of it. Um, it's mostly for their own original programming, and uh, sort of the vague scuttle here on the internet is they usually have really high price tags attached to it, which is why you haven't seen them sub-license it out to a lot of other people. Um, so I thought I'd find more concerning because, like, you know, the just the instability of the streaming market where things can just go away because, you know, agreements end and licensing, you know, no one wants to pony up for license anymore. That I find kind of troubling. But kind of the basic Netflix jail, which usually amounts to, like, I have to wait three to four months to watch something. It's like, it's 2021, my man. There is a million things to watch right now. Like, go find something else to do with your time. You know, be stars or that Godzilla show or whatever is going to be here eventually. Like, come on, get over it a little. <laughs> Plenty of entertainment to keep you amused. You don't need to watch it now and then. It'll still be good in three months, and if it's not, then it probably wasn't going to be very good in the first place. Or maybe not, who knows. Anyways. Uh, it's not good. Uh, it's not a very good thing in- at all. Not only is that bad for discussions about the show so that it can't be uh, hotly discussed while it's airing, which is the best time for any show to be uh, talked about. But it also contributes to our binge watching community as a whole. That is just, it's not healthy. You know, shows don't get a chance to build up a long lasting base or become a discussion among circles because no one has the time to digest it properly. They have to binge watch 13 episodes of a show all at once and then move on to the next thing. There's no there's no gestation period at all. And it's a real shame too. Like I, I understand why that's a thing. And I understand that's why Netflix continues to hoard their shows in their jail. You know, I, I didn't see any of Beastars until the whole thing was out and ready to be consumed because it had a dub. And I know that, that a lot of people thought that was a really good show and that was very popular indeed. But that's that thing that same thing does not happen to all of the shows that Netflix, you know, kind of hoards until they're ready to release the whole thing. So, I, if you know, if I had my way, I would say just release the episodes in Japanese as they're coming out. That's the kind of watching experience that anime fans are already used to. And I can't imagine many people are going to disagree with that. Like, everyone wants their content now, now, now. But this is really detrimental to the overall uh, uh, attention span of the entire otaku community. It, re- it really is. Stop binge watching everything, people. Just enjoy stuff. Sit back, relax with a cup of hot chocolate, and watch your Zombie Land Saga season two. For goodness sakes. Um, I'm a little, and I I get this question a lot, and I deal with a lot of people who are like, "Oh, it's great because you can just binge all the dubs on out." I don't really like it very much because I don't think it's fair to subtitle fans to to fuck them over for like six months. I think that's kind of bullshit. I like that 99% of the time that we get a dub afterwards, and usually those dubs are really, really fucking good. But uh, it's also weird where, like, I I kind of want to try the show before I try the dub to see if I'm interested in it. And, like, for things like Shaman King or Eden Zero, like, I'm not necessarily, like, chomping at the bit to watch Eden Zero. Let's be fucking real. I don't like, I don't like Mafia writing. I, I, I kind of wish I could try those stuff first in, instead of having to wait. So I know, like, when it comes out, it's like, okay, yeah, this is worth my time to w- try to watch the dub. Or, okay, I don't like this show very much. I'm not going to watch the dub. Or, I'm going to try the dub just for the dubbies, but otherwise I really don't give a shit. It's obnoxious, but I've kind of learned to live with it. Is it ideal? God, no. But, I, I don't know, I, I kind of sort of get it, why they do it. 
you want to maximize the total number of eyes at once like you can get a whole batch of episodes it's got multiple language things you want the most eyes on it at at the same time as possible i get it i just also kind of hate the fact that it basically revitalized piracy and scanlations that otherwise would have been killed off by like the boom of like 95 percent of like anime being legally streaming now that's kind of obnoxious it's awful and it's not just because of dubs dark crystal is is in netflix jail right now and i don't know what's going to happen because i don't know if they're ever going to release a physical release of that and there's stuff with uh, other movies and stuff like that i don't like that they're not ever going to release physical media and they buy up these rights. So, no, I'm not happy with it whatsoever. Yeah, the Netflix uh, jail thing kind of sucks and there's really no excuse for it since Netflix is, you know, done a lot of weekly releases of non-anime stuff in their catalog, so... Like, they're clearly capable of doing it if they want to. Uh, that said, there's also, you know, like a ton of anime to watch every season, so sometimes being able to hold off on watching one or two things... For a couple of months kind of worked out better for my schedule anyway so eh, it's kind of a double-edged sword like i would prefer to be able to watch that stuff weekly but sometimes it helps not to i don't know i hate it i absolutely hate it there's so many good shows that are not getting home video releases so many bad shows that are and some of the good ones are getting completely new dubs and like the Baki situation just absolutely gutted me because I love that dub. I mean, you've got, what's his name? You've got Steve Bloom as one of my favorite characters of all time, um, is Dopo Orochi. And I mean, if you can get Steve Bloom in your dub, you try your darndest best to keep Steve Bloom in your dub. Um, so yeah, I'm not a fan of the Netflix jail situation. I'm happy that shows like Violet Evergarden and Cannon Busters and Seven Deadly Sins were finally able to escape the hell. Um, but I just think, just put your shows out on DVD, guys. Please. Come on. And while you're at it, release them weekly. And wrapping this all up with the final question, J2, aka Jared, is there any dub that turned out really good that you weren't really satisfied with? Now, I, I'm assuming that that question means like, was there a dub that you've seen that was technically good, but it just didn't do anything for you personally? Um, most of the time, no, not really. There's not really a lot of times where something is technically competent, but it doesn't really do it for me, except for one kind of instance. The only time that I had a so-so reaction to a dub was only because of one actor, um, and that was the Barakaman dub which uh, had uh, the lead character of Honda was voiced by Robert McCollum. And I, I just didn't dig it. And, you know, like Robert's done a lot of really great kind of uh, sinister, villainous, or just all around uh, douchey voices. Um, not, and I mean that just as his voice, not him as a person. And Honda was, uh, I feel like, his attempt to try to be more of a um, uh, relatable protagonist. But he, he got the mopiness from the character definitely but he didn't really get the the varied emotions of a struggling artist of a of a struggling painter that that character really called for you know i'm gonna have to say be the beginning um it was really great from a technical perspective but it just felt like it was missing something i still have to check out season two to maybe see if that something that i can't quite quantify was in there but yeah, I, I'd i have to say be the beginning. For me, it's sort of... Uh, usually they're dubs that I think are very well made that are made for shows that I don't especially enjoy. Like Show Me Sample, which has a very well made dub for what that show is, but I think that show is trash. And I don't enjoy it, and I have no interest in revisiting the three episodes I watched or watching any more of it. It's not good, so... Um, you know, it is good, but like it's attached to Show Me Sample. Like, I don't want to watch this. I never did an episode of it, but I, 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 I think the Cowboy Bebop film is really good, but I do not see what's so special about it, and I'm going to get comments in the... It, I'm going to get comments on that. Uh, I was a little underwhelmed by the dub to Hunter x Hunter 2011 early on, since there was a lot of double casting in the Hunter exams, and the main cast was kind of so getting used to their characters. Uh, but it improved a lot as it went along, and some of the stuff in New York knew, and 
especially Nick Amara and Dark had some of the best acting I've heard from some of the people in that cast. Especially like Erica Mendez is gone, uh, Christina Valenzuela's Kalua, and Max Middleman's Ant King. Like, those were all some really fantastic performances later on. And uh, by the time it ended, the dub turned out to be really phenomenal, and I think it's frankly one of the best dubs a Shonen show has ever gotten. So, yeah, I'm really glad the Hunter x Hunter dub turned, turned itself around. It's, it was a good time. Uh, yeah, with you, Starlight, because. That show was very good until the end, but I had my problems with the dub. With some characters I'd rather not name. Also, it felt kind of a little awkward. Not because of the draft, though. The draft was fantastic. The fact that there was even a draft in the shows, <laughs> it was fantastic to begin with. Uh, I'm in the minority on this, and everybody seems to like the dub for Princess Tutu. I, I, I just don't really care for it. I liked I liked Lucy Christian in it and that was that's what I will consistently remember her one of two roles as is Duck from Princess Tutu but I'm probably the only person who doesn't like it and that's okay cuz y'all know I like stuff that nobody else likes and dislike stuff that lots of people like that's just who I am. And that is it. That is it for our 5K Q&A. Again, thank you so much to everybody who submitted questions to us via the YouTube video that announced this, the our Twitter, our, our email address, um, and our Patreon followers as well. Uh, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you so, so much uh, for submitting your questions. Again, if we did not get to all of your questions, I do apologize for that because um, there were a ton of questions um a ton of really really amazing questions that were asked and some people might not have gotten to all of them but thank you so much for your questions and i hope we gave you some fun answers to work with and we and i hope you got you guys are getting to know us a little bit more uh after today again thank you uh if you want to follow anything that we hit dub tug here do please be sure to if you're currently on the youtube channel make sure you are subscribed to us on youtube that way uh, we post new videos every week of some sort and maybe in the next few years we can get to 10,000 subscribers i don't know who, who who knows sky's the limit here right guys if you also uh, you can, if you want to take us on the go, uh, you can listen to us on Spotify, Podbean, and Apple Podcasts. Please support us there too. Um, it'd be great. It would help us out a lot. If you want to follow uh, all of our other shenanigans, you can follow us on Twitter at Dub Talk Podcast. We also have a Twitch account at Dub Talk Podcast as well. We also have, if you want to support us in another capacity, we have our Kofi account which it will be linked in the description below and if you want to support us in even greater capacity we also have our patreon account uh, to which to give us give wonderful thanks to our patrons we have megan's mom and dad michelle travis miraculous corazon nico robin but with the owie hands sue tweet victor mayborda carly lestakow crimson and Kinna, jacob wilson j2 aka jared julia w marissa lindy and otaku anthony thank you so much for your continued support um without you we wouldn't be able to continue to grow and expand like we have been and i think that's it uh follow all of the social all of our twitter handles will probably be in the description below for all 13 uh members of the podcast if you want to go follow us on our each of our twitters uh for any reason and that should be it so again thank you so much thank you for getting us to 5,000 subscribers on youtube thank you for sticking with us for like five plus years now uh we hope you enjoyed today's little fun episode and you got to know us a bit better so until next time guys thank you very much and otaku on my friends 